ESP.bet. Watch and bet live. Okay, I'm here for another episode of Reflections, and my guest is going to be Bjergsen, obviously the long-time mid laner of TSM, but before that, for some period of time, Copenhagen Wolves in NIP in the EU LCS. Right, let's start here, Bjergsen. Mm -hmm. So there's a connection that people have referenced. I've seen it actually used when you first came to NA, which people often cited where in some online tournament in like season two, you actually bizarrely stood in for TSM. But from what I remember, like, first of all, people need to realize <coughs> that sounds really weird because it already sounds weird. Like what the best NA team you played some online tournament, but in season two, people have to realize these teams used to play in online tournaments literally like two times a week. It was like th there was a lot of those. That's basically what you did when you were at home. You know, they weren't, they didn't scrim twenty four seven. They used to stream a yeah. lot. They used to play online tournaments. Then they did a bit of scrimming. So when they say that, right, bearing in mind you would have been like I think like fifteen years old or something ridiculous. I think wasn't the story something like Dyrus knew you or something, right? Was it just something like a pure one off and like it was just like any random person just dragged dragged in to 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 stand in? Did you actually know the the players themselves? I think they oversold that story a bit. Like, it was no, not, not too many people have asked me about that actually. Uh, it it was somewhat random. I think uh, all of TSM was playing on the EU server because NA was apparently just really bad and they had no competition and. They felt like they would learn more playing on EU, so they were playing like they were playing the European go for laws and playing solo queue here. And just through solo queue, I, I met Dars, and <clears throat> since he was <laughs> at the time, I remember there was a controversy where he said that in EU people are trolling him, so he can't reach rank one or something. <laughs> okay. So then, then he decided he wanted to always have a duo queue partner, and then I ended right. up. He felt like I performed well in the in the solo queue games. He met me, so we duo queued a lot, and then. Andy had to get his wisdom tooth pulled out one day, and and he just wrote me on Skype because he didn't know a lot of European players, and that's kind of that's how I came to play. Only two matches with them in that tournament, and then Andy came back, but I think we won both. Not not that I had much of an impact in some of those games, but you know I was a part of it. Okay, right. One thing I want to get to uh, is. Obviously, the whole storyline people know about the beginning of your career was this situation where it coincided with the start of LCS, and then the start of LCS meant you actually just, in the way the legal setup was, you actually couldn't play, and in fact, you couldn't even help your team qualify, and therefore, famously, you were one of the better players in the team. Some of the other players in the team weren't that well known outside of Denmark, and the mm -hmm. team wasn't expected to qualify. They did qualify, which... Famously, in led to this infamous move by Deficial, where he just said, like, fuck you, Bjergsen, on the official <laughs> broadcast. Which I can tell yeah. you, ESL did not appreciate, by the way. Even though they played it off like, ha, 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 oh, that yeah, Deficial. Course, like, they, they didn't appreciate that at all. <laughs> Especially being around at the time, I don't think it was actually Riot who rather qualified. I think they were just like, ESL was actually like a subcontractor for Riot. So, not not exactly what they loved, but whatever. Yeah. Good old Deficial. funny. The fans he, liked it. You know, yeah, he's... he's He's polished it up a bit since then. He's, it looks a bit better. But this is the question I have for you, right? Is since you were, it was always your age that was stressed at the beginning. Like you literally couldn't play because of your age. It already set up this interesting scenario where it actually didn't matter if you think about it. Like opening Wolves wasn't that good because they were allowed to lose because, oh, Bjergsen's coming soon. Like, you know, oh, well, it won't really count until Bjergsen gets there. So actually your age is the first thing people focused on. And I feel like in that period where people didn't know you as a person, that's actually why every story ever written about you at the beginning of your career makes you sound like a like a vulnerable little bird that someone found <laughs> and they were like, oh, we've got to take care of this bird. Oh, it's injured. We've got to nurse it back to health. Because obviously all the early stories were the ones that you told in some of your interviews, like that when you were young, it was difficult for you at school and your parents were worried about you and you were, you were like, it makes it sound like you were like the youngest in the family and you were, what? This, see, this is very, this is what I want to ask about Bjergsen because to uh -huh. me, because I've only known you when you were in TSM and obviously actually TSM's had a somewhat acrimonious relationship with me you've always seemed like a very confident person to me in fact i even remember i did an interview with you when you were in copenhagen wolves i think it was when it, i think it was when it still was i think it was the end of wolves i maybe. was in nip at that time i, I think just, i just maybe, i just joined nip i think yes you could be right okay so what at the, what period of time are we actually talk about when, when we talk about the person who was worried about bullying or something it must be pretty early right uh 
I mean, it was pretty much up until I, I became pro. I, I was not a very confident person. I was really shy, and especially Deficio and the people at Copenhagen Wolves and early times in NIP, they helped me kind of open up and warm up to people because they're all very nice guys, and I was very anxious meeting them in person for the first time and going from only playing with people online. But uh, it was like the test, Deficio, uh, Svenskern, and... Godbro and the Copenhagen Wolves organization. I think they really helped me kind of break out of my bubble and be more comfortable with people. So I think it was kind of like that. I was kind of like the bird that needed to be nurtured and I was not... I think if they didn't value my skill as much, they wouldn't have dealt with all those problems that I had because it was kind of like they actually had to take care of me like a little brother or or a kid. But uh, yeah, I'm really grateful for People like Deficio who, you know, he, he pretty much told my parents that he was just going to take care of me and watch out for me at every step of the way in the early phase because I was in a pretty rough point in my life, to be honest. If it was that soon then, but like in sort of becoming a pro, did it actually impact your game at all? I mean, obviously, if we think about this period of time, end of season two, early season three, a mid laner could be incredibly powerful in the game. Like, were you actually a confident player in the game, in a team setting? Were you kind of like bold to be decisive, to be a leader? I wasn't much of a, a leader or I, I wouldn't really tell people what to do. But within the game, I was confident because all the social issues I had was was out of the game. It was with people. But I was a, you know, a keyboard warrior, I guess. So when I was at home, when I was playing, when I was in the zone, I felt confident, uh, somewhat toxic. I think a lot of people were back in the day. I was really immature. And so, so when I was in the game, I... I didn't feel those same anxious anxious feelings, but there's pretty much no no leadership for me back then. It was just I, I was focusing on my own play. I wanted to perform well. I wanted to be uh, the carry, and I wanted a lot of resources because that was I didn't trust my teammates very much back then, and the game wasn't as team focused. So uh, I think it, it took a long time for me to start developing any kind of leadership abilities because I was mainly just focus on myself. And in terms of, I guess, how, when, you, when you asked if it affected me at all as a pro player, I think it mostly affected me in terms of that I was I was really anxious to do media stuff like interviews and features and, and those kinds of things, especially during the Copenhagen Wolves time. I think there's one or two interviews out there and they were both times that I was forced because I was really uncomfortable with myself and I couldn't see myself as a role model or for someone people look up to because I wasn't happy with myself. I was extremely insecure, so I didn't see why anyone would want to even hear an interview from me. So, right, Since you said there that you were like a little bit toxic, but you added the caveat, which is totally <laughs> legit, by the way, which first of all, everyone was in the early days, especially before like, you know, enforced professionalism and the LCS, etc. But then you have to add in as well coming from the European server. Like, yeah. here's the thing. I've not, I once made a video, right, where I said that, like, it's overrated, the idea that there's toxicity in EU. Like, I never denied it happened. What I meant was, you know, it just looks really bad if you come from America and you're used to, like, sports and, like, oh, you've got to be you got to be straight list and look good yeah. for the people. Like, well, I meant that sense, you know. Definitely, yeah, obviously, the, if you ever read the team chat, it's wild on EU servers. But in a way, right, it's sort of the world you just live in, right? You just take it for granted. Because what I want to ask is this is if if you were someone who had had this these issues in real life did you kind of uh did you kind of like the chance to let loose and be a bit toxic then because i mean if you shit talk in the game right and this is actually the problem i used to have at school bjergsen right naturally uh -huh. people probably wouldn't have fucked with that much but the problem is i used to shit talk like in real life as though it was the internet and like no one could come and beat you up afterwards and what i quickly learned in real life was well, in real life, if you just lose like the mental argument and the other person kick your ass, well, they just go straight to that, don't they? Because it's like a get you get out of jail free card. Like they win no matter what if they just kick your ass. So, online, were you, did you just let loose a bit when when you when you found you were good at something? And then obviously, I'm assuming especially Danish players and random European but people must have been talking mad shit. Uh yeah, I it wasn't. I think it was more so just kind of a an ego thing, you know. I was very delusional, like a lot of young people were. Was Legends the first were... thing you were good at? Uh, I mean, it depends. I, I was pretty decent at, at at sports, but not to the level where I was pro. But I was in the best T 
team in our city at handball, which doesn't mean much, but it was something that I was good at and I was getting praised for. But I guess it's the first thing in my life that I've been confident and, and proud of my abilities, yeah. Okay, right. When we look back now, obviously that storyline that I related about how Copenhagen Wolves still made it in anyway, even though Bjergsen wasn't at the LCS qualifier and then the official got to say his epic line. Right? The whole reason why that's a good story is they really weren't supposed to make it through this qualifier. Like a lot of people don't remember. They'll think to themselves like, oh, well, I remember the first seasons of LCS, actually in both regions, you know, there was a couple of teams that were crap and they were at the bottom of the table. I mean, Copenhagen Wolves was one of them at one point in time, obviously. But what people will rem forget is actually at the beginning of the LCS period, you had a bunch of good land teams. I mean, a famous example I remember off the top of my head was the Millennium team. There was a bunch of people who were like much better and bigger names than teams like Copenhagen Wolves who didn't make it in through this qualifier. Yeah, and Millennium was the team that they beat in yes, the qualifying game. And the player, obviously, that they were taking as your substitute wasn't even Danish. It was that guy, Kautard, who yeah, was actually later on obviously <laughs> played in LCS with them. So how unlikely was it for them to make it? Like when you made this comment to the official, you're like, yeah, they're not, you're not going to make it or something. <laughs> like, first of all, that does sound like pretty toxic. And, but you obviously were joking, so I agree. But how, how much truth was it? Did you actually think there was like, they're not going to qualify. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to come back for the next qualifier. You know, we make it in for summer. What was what was going on in this scenario? Yeah, I, mean, I pretty much thought there was no chance they would make it in because we would scrim Millennium quite a bit for some online tournament like Northern Open or DreamHack, I don't remember. And we were just getting crushed by Millennium in scrims with, with me playing. And obviously, I thought I was better than Cartard at the time. So I thought that, and then so did my teammates, so did Deficio and Tess. So I think we all we all kind of felt like there was a really, really low chance. And I hadn't really taken into consideration even the fact that we could make it to LCS and I would have this chance to leave school and go do this full time. It was like a 1% chance in my head. I, I didn't think as far to, oh, we can go to the next qualifier because I didn't even really understand what LCS was. I was told it's like kind of this league and maybe I can move to Germany. That sounds cool. But at the time, I didn't understand what that actually really meant. So I, I had pretty much zero expectations for, for us to win, but I don't think it was really a toxic thing. I think the whole team felt that, and maybe that's why they played so well, because they could come in kind of with no regrets, underdog mentality. Uh, I mean, that's the storyline that keeps repeating, right? Like the underdogs coming out on top because they're just playing without pressure. I think that was a big part of it. And sure. Millennium had all that hype, and I heard that after they started losing games in the best of three, best of five, I don't remember, they also had some big personalities that started really, uh, what's it called? Uh, they Argument. started really arguing, pretty much arguing, yeah. I mean, they they were really at each other's throats after just losing one game because their expectations were so high, the adrenaline is running, uh, but our team didn't have that problem. Okay, right. In this early period, right, obviously when you joined the team, as I said, the whole narrative of Copenhagen Wolves, even they were losing, people were like, right, but you've got to wait until this guy gets here. He was the best player. He's just not old enough. Right? Obviously, people were waiting for you to play. You famously had the Syndra Quadra in the first game you did play, and then the team won some games, made the playoffs. So, you know, the, the stage was set where, yeah, people expected Bjergs to be the star player. But funnily enough, the only other person I do remember people actually giving legit hype to in this team was Sven Skerin. And what people often forget was that when the team became an IP and had the bad start to the summer split, when those players left the team, difference is people like Godbro were kicked from the team. But actually, I remember it was even stated in the official statement like that Sven Skeren chose to leave. So clearly yeah. at this point in time, he was a good player. I remember I asked you in the grilled interview I did with you at the time, because I'd, I'd looked up online at like some obscure detail that Sven Skeren had actually played briefly with Froggen. And you told me what was at the time quite a funny anecdote where I sort of asked you like, so as a result, did you know, so, you know, was it weird to play with someone who basically his player before was, his mid laner before was Froggen? And you told this funny anecdote where it's like, um, uh, Sven Skerin was saying like, oh, yeah, uh, Bjerg said, yeah, I'm going to need the blue, which at the time in, in like season two, you know, famously, yeah, Froggen, no. would, you know, would just get given all the buffs by his middle. But you said like that Froggen was like, now nah, you can just take that. Like, I'll, I'll just kill their mid laner or whatever and get yeah. his. Some stupid story. That I mean, yeah, that's like, the story. It, that's the thing. Me. Oh, I'll just kill their mid laner and take their blue yeah, instead. It's, it, it, here's the thing. If it was a Froggen documentary, that's a straight fire story. But my question <laughs> is this though. So what was the young... 
Sven Skeren like? Who, who was this guy? Because obviously you, you get there's a weird Ooh. connection where you team up with him years later. So what was he like as a younger guy? Yeah, he was really the ultimate embodiment of the keyboard warrior, where he was <laughs> extremely toxic online. He told me things that I, I definitely cannot say uh, in this interview. But then when you meet him in person, he's like really shy. He's a super nice guy. He's he's really caring. He cares about other people's feelings. He's very helpful. So it was just a complete contrast. And Deficio told me that too. He's like, you know, Svenskren, he, he tries to do his best to look like a tough guy online. But when you meet him in person, he's like an angel. So it, it was it was really hard to kind of disconnect those two people, the online pers- persona that I had met with the, the Svenskern that I met in person. And that's also kind of been a storyline when Svenskern joined TSM in 2016, 2017, when none of the fans, there hasn't been much content uh, of Dennis on the internet. So they didn't know how he was as a person. They only knew about the, the Taipei story. So they just yeah. assumed that he was an asshole and that he was like really arrogant at things. and. Now that there's actually been TSM Legends and interviews and he's gotten more exposure, people can see kind of what his real person is. I think he just, he needed that outlet uh, on like, maybe similar to what you said before, it's kind of like, (laughs) instead of talking shit in real life, you would just talk shit online. And I think he was very much like that, but in person, he was a super nice guy. When the team, since the team obviously was all Danish once you joined it, made this hard decision during the split to basically let some of the players go, who obviously made it to LCS and then get these other players in, right? If you look at the results, it clearly worked because the team was a lot better. And actually, it's kind of unfair to judge that team because with Extinct just literally quitting when you're in the middle of winning, you can't really say that it failed overall, just it didn't do well. So We lost one game and then he just (laughs) pieced out. Was it hard though to, like, were you someone who was cool with making like a ruthless decision like that, you know? Yeah, I was pretty prepared for it because... I did a lot of sports growing up. My my parents forced me to do sports, and so I was just a hyper competitive person. And when I saw my teammates, like mainly Gobbro and and the Test, they just weren't taking the game as seriously. They weren't in solo queue. They weren't playing the champions that they were playing in scrims. They they weren't able to actually train. You know, they were playing the game, but they weren't training. They weren't practicing. They were just playing the game mindlessly, playing whatever they wanted to, and it just didn't feel like they were really taking it serious. So, I, I i mean, this was my whole life. I, I had a miserable life at home. I dropped out of school. So this is really my everything. So I wanted people on my team that had that same kind of drive as me. So, I mean, I felt really sad about Svenskern leaving because I didn't really have any problems with him. But he, whereas I cared a lot about having driven teammates and teammates I cared about winning, Dennis really cared about the the team environment and the friendships that he had built and kind of our bond so that when we kicked Godbro, he left because he just couldn't see a team without Godbro because they were such good friends. So that, that made me pretty sad. But yeah, I was, I was pretty cold-blooded about uh, removing Godbro and, and Tess from the team, but I'm not really shy of saying that because I think you have to be willing to make those changes if you want to win. When um, this period happened, right, that... As I said, when you got Extinct and Maluno in, actually it was going really well. And this was the famous split where it was insanely close in the ULCS. Like almost everyone basically had their turn to be like top three in the league, depending on what period of the split it was. Mm-hmm. Right? When, when you're at this point in time and you, you're winning all these games, it's looking really good. Were you actually a cocky player privately? Like, I mean, I remember, for example, that famous story where I think it was when Febbervan had only just been promoted to the LCS and he and he made that like statement in some interview, like in one year I will be better than Xbeck and Frog and everyone's like, holy shit. And obviously, like fair play, his team did do pretty well. But that's like you know, people expect a human letters to sort of be like that, to think like, right, well now I'm in the pros, so fuck all the legends, you know, it's my time. Were you were you kind of once you had a good team behind you, were you were you cocky in a way? Were you confident? Mm. I don't think I was confident to the level of, of Febben because I was still a very shy and insecure person out of the game and I I had a hard time standing up to my teammates and having discussions and disagreeing to to what they were saying and kind of putting my points out there. So I was very low in in kind of the leadership role or a hierarchy of the team. Uh, I was just good within the game, but I wasn't a great teammate and I wasn't very good at influencing my teammates or really getting my points across. So 
I don't know. I think it really fluctuated a lot when I was playing well for a consistent period of time. My my ego or my confidence would grow a lot, and if I just had a few bad games, I I, I would think like, oh man, I'm so bad. Is this something I can continue doing? Do I even have a future? Uh, so I was just very insecure, and I, I would flip flop my opinion of myself around. I guess if that makes any sense. Not when not you, a very not a very stable human being at the time. I would say. Okay, when you came to join TSM, right? In my reflections I did with Reginald, he actually revealed a pretty spicy detail that no one's ever heard before. That basically, mm -hmm. it could, it, it, if it wasn't TSM Bjergsen, it would have been TSM Expeke, and that he actually had sort of like Expeke on the hook to potentially come to NA to join to replace him. Which, if you think about it in terms of like name value, that actually would be much easier to sell to fans if you're like, hey, I've got one of the best EU mids. Yeah, just of course. Old, right? Well, did you actually know about this at the time when you were talking to them to potentially join? That you know there were other candidates there. No, uh, at the time I, I had no idea. So because if you it's remember, pretty interesting right? to hear that back. Andy is right. Andy's pretty crazy for doing that. Because the thing is, in the early days, I think he even admitted this in his reflections. In the early days, he did oversell that aspect where he always used to say that, like, you know, I found Bjergsen in relegations. You know, he made it sound as though, like, you know, he found you in the trash. And he's like, he, he like polished it off, like, oh, this could be good one day. Even though, like. Everyone in Europe was like, come on, mate, we have just watched this guy play for like two splits. He was pretty good in Europe and, you know, his team sucked the first split and he, he had these issues in the second split. What mm -hmm. did you ever think when, when Reginald used to say that? Because he did make it sound like, he, he, you know, you were sort of a failure and he picked you up for TSM. Um, I mean, I don't know. I was in talks with some other teams at the, at the time too. Uh, actually, I, I was talking to Curse at that time as well because I, I really wanted to be in a gaming house especially because that's something I never had with Copenhagen Wolves and NIP. I don't know about Andy discovering me. I think in terms of NA wasn't very aware of what was happening in the sure. EU LCS. So in that sense, he kind of felt like maybe he discovered me because a lot of the NA players hadn't really heard of me. Andy probably didn't really hear of me until maybe the end of the split at NIP and definitely the NA fans, a lot of them hadn't heard of me. So I think in his own little bubble, uh, it felt like he discovered me but like you said in the grand scheme of things I, I had been playing for a bit and there were other people recognizing my talent even though i think i was still a very unstable player at the time if people remember when you first came to na i remember you were one of the you were basically the best salesman ever for the solo mid network because if people <laughs> remember you were the original guy who came in as the big import started streaming straight away got all the massive viewer figures you know like you did a great job making it seem like you sort of in the same way as you know like rich people on instagram like sort of sell the lifestyle by having all the chains and the the champagne <laughs> you basically did that for the solo mid networks everywhere every player who joins tsm thinks they're going to get that right when you did this when you came to na and obviously Obviously, you know, as we said, with your background, you're not exactly like the person who's the natural I example of who would move abroad to another continent and go play with all this pressure, etc. Did it just go great from the first moment? Did it? Was it really like it looked on camera? Like you come, you start streaming, even in the games you were doing super sick and you were tearing up all the NA players. Was it? Did everything just go perfect from the, the first moment? In the off season, which is when I came, there was still an off season for quite a while. Everything was pretty good, yeah. I, Lena and Dan and Andy all encouraged me to stream and the other players encouraged me to stream, but it was something I wanted to too. Even when I was on Copenhagen Wolves and NIP, I would stream for I don't know, 10, 10, 15 viewers or I think up to maybe 200 at the very max. I just really enjoyed teaching people and kind of taking what I had learned and, and helping other people learn. It was kind of like I could take this thing that I'm doing playing video games and I could actually do some good out of it and make other people happy. So that's something I really enjoyed. Obviously it was very different to stream in front of many thousands of people. When when practice actually started, it was pretty different. I've heard of this thing, it's called like imposter something, imposter, imposter syndrome, syndrome maybe. Syndrome. Imposter yeah. syndrome, yeah. You feel like you don't belong. I think that's pretty much, I pretty much felt that I didn't actually know if I had it in me to be on TSM and be this good. I kind of felt like Andy had a lot more faith in me than I actually did in myself. So I, I also felt like I was coming into a role that I didn't really know if I could fill. And I definitely couldn't fill at the time because Andy was a leader and I had zero leadership capabilities. I was supposed to lead these people that are much older than me, much more experienced than me, much more knowledgeable. So everything was really good in the beginning. But once the season started and 
I guess mostly playing against Cloud9 at the time because they were the only team that had any resemblance of macro. Uh, I, I started kind of feeling the insecurities bubbling back up and thinking like, oh man, are they just sitting here looking at me thinking, where's Reginald? Uh, but playing against all the other teams, we could just destroy them mechanically. But playing against C9 and their macro was a big eye opener for me. And it kind of took me from being only focused on myself, only focused on my mechanics, playing assassins and killing everyone to actually thinking critically about the game and uh, the team aspect of it. Maybe then you've you've actually answered something I was going to ask you then, which is that when I talked to Reginald, he actually tried to um, make the case basically that one of the reasons he picked you, one of the reasons he wanted you on the team, <coughs> was to that he for some for some reason he he saw some similarity Sorry. between you and him as people, and obviously as you're referencing for the role, literally at the time at least. And I mean, if people have seen some of the reality things for a few seasons later, maybe even as well, Reginald did kind of think that the game should still be played the way where he played it when he was the leader and, you know, the mid laner. I mean, just in terms of natural role, he's correct. The mid laner actually obviously has had a massive impact on the game in terms of like you're in the middle of the map. And then obviously he used to be the shot caller. So to him, it's natural to have a star player, to have the mid laner be a shot caller. In the early days, did you see this? Did you see any similarity between you and him? Well, this must have been pretty imposing, right, for someone to tell you. I mean, as you said, in the other teams, you were a good player, but you weren't the leader. You know, you were you were just someone being taken care of. So not only have you gone to NA, I mean, I'll admit behind the scenes, when I heard about this move, I was like, this move is going to go terribly. Right? This is someone where if, P, if, if he needs a bit of protection, you know, first of all, he's joining a team where we've seen videos of them just tearing each other up. And then, <laughs> and then not only that, He's literally replacing Reginald, who was the guy who was arguing with people. So I was worried it wasn't going to work out because it's a big responsibility, right? Um, yeah, I, I think the biggest similarities between us is probably, or maybe what he saw in me. I, I can't say for sure, but I think most likely it's like the hyper competitiveness because I was a terribly sore loser and I was still really critical of myself. And I think maybe he was watching some of my streams, but it was... I talked about my thought process a lot and I, I just cared a lot about always improving and not being static and always learning new things. That, that's probably the main thing we had in common because a lot of the outside abilities like leadership capabilities, I didn't have any of those. And I don't think I ever really pretended to to be able to do that. Uh, so I guess he must have just seen something in me and how competitive and driven I was. And maybe that's what drew me to him. I'm not sure really. Since you referred to the Cloud9 rival, because obviously this was the big matchup in that first split. I mean, funnily enough, people forget this. It was actually your first ever game, and that was the one where Hyde just like played Teemo. And <laughs> it's not exactly the best introduction to the league. It was, it was a terrible game as well. So when you first came, obviously they were the big rival. You know, TSM wasn't on top. Cloud9 had just had that ridiculous split where they won like 30 games out of 33 or something outrageous. There was Both teams were very good in this spring split, and it was kind of clear, you know, they're on a collision course for the final. But then if mm -hmm. people remember this final, I have to say, this is the most boring NLCS final ever because it's just yeah, it sort of just, just comprehensively and it very decisively wins the series. And even though Bjergsen has been popping off against everyone else, you just kind of don't do anything in this final, right? So what, what was it like then? Because when, I, when you were describing it there, play, uh, you know, having someone tell you, right, you're the leader now, you're going to shot call even though you haven't done it before. Oh, Andy, the star player. It sounds like the biggest nightmare of all is to play against Ty's Cloud9, where famously they had this amazing macro and he was so good at shot calling the game. And obviously he doesn't, as, an, as a mid laner, try to like smash 1v1 in the lane, you know? So what was the experience like trying to play against that? It sounds pretty confusing, to be fair. Yeah, it was pretty confusing. But I, I had the very immature mentality of, I think every game except for maybe the first game in the series, I was winning my lane really hard. And after the game, what was really going through my mind is, oh, I'm up 20, 30 CS in lane. How are we not winning this game? Because that's just the this immature... This classic mid mentality. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's really how I felt. I was, what, 17 at the time. And that's genuinely what I felt. I, I was, I thought, hi, has the better team. I'm beating him in lane. I have more pressure, but my, but like my team is not able to translate the lead. And I think that was, losing that game was kind of spotting the seed that, I have to actually learn how to influence my teammates and understand the game at a macro level if I want to succeed against these teams that do that. And whether that was whether that was just high or whether it was his team or whether it was what he taught the team, there was an obvious difference in the way they played 
the game as a team, how they played around minion waves, turrets, objectives, like coordinating pink wards, setting up on objectives first. We had just a very super, super basic view of the game. And we pretty much just played through win lane, win game. But in the games where I was the only one to win the lane or they were playing a lot of globals, especially, which we had huge trouble playing against because you actually have to use your brain to play against globals. Uh, we just fell apart. And in that series, I, I remember I felt horrible after we just got completely smashed. Is it weird to play against someone who basically knows they might lose lane but can still have impact on the game? I remember we did like a summon in Insight fairly early on where I remember there's a famous clip where Froggen's like, when he watched high play, he was like, "What is he? why is he just leaving lane and leaving all this farm, you know, to go and roam to some other? Like, to him, that was like an alien concept, because as you're saying, if you're better in lane, you just think, well, especially if I'm mid laner, no, I'll, I'll just get ahead in CS, and that's going to be like an item before him, you know? It's the logical chain of events to win the game, isn't it? Yeah, I, I don't think Kai was playing the game in the most effective way. I still don't think he was a super strong individual player, but he knew how to influence his teammates, and he knew how to use the mid laner to also influence the enemy jungle and contest enemy jungle camps and stuff. And obviously that was a concept that we really took to heart and it was kind of our bread and butter strategy is contest enemy blue, contest enemy red, and play strong laners. But I mean, for the longest time, I generally just thought I was the better player than high and he just has the better team or I, I just thought I'm a strong player, but I just need to have a high like teammate <laughs> actually made that has good enough game knowledge so that I can apply my skill and I wanted to continue to focus on my skill but obviously as time went on I understood how limited that mentality is and how it's not going to get me very far if we have a look basically until the funnily enough the fateful split where you got yellow star actually you didn't really have anyone else in this team that as much as everyone criticized you, there wasn't really anyone else that was like a logical fit to be the shot caller. Because if people remember, after this was when Lost Boy joined and was actually a really big influence on the team, but obviously he doesn't have like super fluent English, or at least he's the sort of person yeah. where, it, you know, it's better when he's not in the game, obviously, when he has time to think, etc. Then yeah. obviously Dyrus is never exactly the most vocal person overall anyway. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, he's, he's something of a follower in that mentality, you know. You had Wild Turtle, I mean... They have a term in America, Space Cadet. He's just a bit of a weird guy. You know, he's not the sort of person you imagine masterminding the whole game. And then the junglers obviously were amazing in Santorin. Again, not exactly the sort of people that you'd think as natural leaders. So mm. did you were you forced to be the shot caller in a way? Did you have to just, in your mind, think, well, I just have to do this role? Uh, yeah, but I don't actually think I knew what it really meant until much later on, I, I would think. What was right, your I, idea I, of shot caller? I mean, it was just, I, I knew that I had to be the shot caller, but I didn't know how to really learn that and how to really implement that because Andy would tell me, in, oh, in this situation, you should be doing this. But if you don't actually understand why you should be doing this, why this concept doesn't apply in a different scenario, you know, you really have to build your game knowledge up from from the very depths of, of not really understanding the team game. And I had to learn how to use my teammates and how I can help my teammates and it it was just very foreign to me, and I didn't really know what to do until, I guess, I started working with with Loco and Andy. But I think the closest thing to a leader, person with leadership qualities that I had was probably amazing because, even though he didn't have insane macro knowledge, he was at least a very assertive uh, person. So I, sure. I learned from that. He was he spoke his mind always. He wasn't afraid to have discussions or arguments or whatever you want to call them and. He was generally really confident in himself. So uh, having a teammate with those abilities kind of, <laughs> he liked to call himself alpha a lot. It, it kind of helped me see that I can be a little bit more like that and it would benefit the team. Maybe not to the point of amazing because I felt like at the time he had a really big ego. But if I could learn, if I could learn some of those things, some of his confidence and some of his being willing to confront people and being willing to talk out things that might be difficult to talk about. Uh, I could be a better player and a better leader. Do you remember when you were at this World Season 4 Worlds and you heard this news that Sven Skerin was getting suspended for half the games? Because obviously his team, SK, was in your group and getting suspended sort of did give you a free win immediately in the group and you were famously in the group with North Koreans. So... In, in a competitive sense, it was good for you, but do you remember hearing this news that he was actually in, like... I mean, it's pretty deep shit, actually. 
Yeah, he is a friend of mine, so we we talked about it pretty soon after it happened, and <laughs> it, it was obvious that I had been in NA for a while, so I kind of had a better understanding of because. W- in, in Europe or in the US, you just say the stupidest stuff and people don't really take offense and you don't really learn what's right and wrong. But as soon as I came to NA, anytime I said something inappropriate, people would let me know, my teammates would let me know and tell me this is not appropriate here. This is not something you can say in America. Uh, people don't take as fondly to those you know, jokes or whatever you want to call it. So I was a bit more cultured, I guess, at that time. But he gener- he didn't understand why what he did was wrong because he just hadn't had people tell him what was right and wrong. So I felt really sorry for him because he's not an evil person. Like I said, he's just a keyboard warrior that didn't understand what he could do and what he wasn't supposed to do or say. Sure. But uh, I mean, of, of course, it was it was nice for us to have kind of kind of a free win. But I mean, he came back and took revenge on us in the last game, so that sure. wasn't very fun. Okay, when you but just before that, when you won the, your first LCS split in the summer, right? People always forget this buildup of the storyline because obviously, if you win in the end, everything's great, and especially if you know how fans are, it doesn't matter if if a te- if the fans team wins by like one second or a million miles. They always talk shit as though it was a million miles, right? So first. To every TSM fan obviously was telling like me, for example, like oh, I knew they'd win from day one, etc. People forget how dire this split was. It was the one where at the beginning. Obviously, Expecial got kicked out of the team. At the time, considered actually like one of the best support players in the entire West. Then mm-hmm. you had, and actually, funnily enough, uh, like in one of the only people on the team who actually had some level of, could sort of help with shot calling, maybe. Then you had the whole scenario where initially it was Glebu who came in and then he had his own problems and he had to leave. And yes, eventually, you got Lost Boy uh, as the support, you got Loco as a coach. By the end of the split, things sort of came together and then there was this inspired playoff one where, again, people forget it wasn't three zeros all the way. It was like every series was close. Even the three one against Dignitas was the one mm-hmm. with all those ridiculous games that were like right down to the wire. So it was all pretty close, you know, to get to the final, to win the final, to definitely go to Worlds. What do you remember of this split? Was, was there a lot of pressure on you? Was it tough? I was really, really nervous, especially going into the Dignitas game. I remember my mind was racing like crazy the days before and I hadn't really every other game was just it was just a best of one you know it it didn't matter that much if we if we lost like it really sucked and I felt bad but in the grand scheme of things you had it was like 26 games or something I mean we played a lot of games back then so it was you lose one game you still have 25 other chances to win but I think there was still the whole TSM legacy of always making the finals so I really felt that pressure it's it's my my time to really prove myself and we weren't like you said in, in the greatest shape of the time so i remember going into that dignitas match was really uh it was really nerve-wracking and loco had to teach me the some like basic mindfulness meditation strategies to kind of try to calm myself down but i was a nervous wreck but i think once you get into the game and once you start focusing on the game all that stuff goes away i didn't think about you know, I didn't think about what was going to happen after or maybe how bad or how good we were. Once we were in the game and playing, that was all my mind was focused on. What was it like when you actually won? And especially, obviously, the context as we've set up before is like you were meeting Cloud9 again. This time it wasn't them just sweeping you aside. What was, what was actually winning like? Like, for example, okay, when people are training, you know, it's often a thing people do. Like they imagine themselves winning and what would it be like? And that's the goal. When you actually get there, is the goal... As, as good as people hype it up to be? That time, yeah, I, w- I would say. That's definitely the sweetest victory I've had. Every split, every season I've won since then has just not compared because it, it was my first time. There was, no, there was no such thing as us being the best team or being the favorites. It was, I, I even felt like after you won that it was likely 3-9 was the better team, but we performed better on that day or just on one of those games and we were clutch. So it was a pretty... Yeah, pretty ridiculous feeling, yeah. It's one of my very dear moments, I would say. When you were when you went to this world and as we've referenced, you know, you got out of the group, you, it was the one with Star and Royal Club and SK Gaming in, you got out of the group, but infamously, obviously, you drew Samsung White, who a lot of people at this tournament who were like players and people around the tournament sort of were like, This team's gonna win this tournament because 
I mean, I, I think actually I did, I did an inflections with Darius and he told some story like that you won something. I think he said you won something like three games out of 30 you played against Samson. Like, yeah. So was I it think really it was, that bad? It was, it was something like two or three wins and we played 20 and we lost 20 to 30 games. It was, it was pretty harsh, but they were one of our staple screen partners for whatever reason. I think Loco was friends with one of the Samsung coaches or one of the sure. players and I guess they saw us as training grounds and a way for them to kind of hide picks and practice things that they didn't want to show against other teams. So we ended up playing them a lot. And they were also in another group than us. And that was that was pretty hard because it's not fun as a competitor to just be so clearly outclassed consistently. But it was a it was a way for me to learn a lot. But <laughs> no matter how much uh, losing teaches you, it, it's not fun as a competitor to just get completely crushed like that and then right. once we had, once we had to play them in quarters it was like you know we can win it's not likely we can win but we're just going to go out and and do our best and see what comes of it what about what was what's it like to play since you played the swords and scrims and then obviously in this famous quarter final which like anyone who's a tsm here this is obviously like the the, the dream game to watch because it's not like you just lose, but famously, obviously, they get so many early advantages in every game, and they're even like doing all these like BM drafts, you know, that are like super late scaling, and they're still winning in the first five minutes. Well, famously, that team is actually people. A lot, some of some of the more casual fans don't know this, but it's not just that that team was the best. They basically sort of like reinvented how League of Legends was played in terms of the macro element of how Dandy and Matter <laughs> split the map, etc. What was it actually like to play against Prime Samsung White? What was so tough about playing them? It can't just be the players, right? Uh, in in scrims, it wasn't nearly as bad as it was on stage. In scrims, it just felt like they they really understood like their champions, their power spikes, how their comp functions, and how to play macro, how to play off power spikes. And these are very basic things now, but they were just able to execute them on them so consistently. Their basics were so good. But then we played them on stage, and they had all those things I just mentioned, and on top of that, they had really good level one strategies. I remember they had one game where, I don't know, they like took their own blue, and then Looper was proxying in between the towers as Singed, and then he stopped Amazing from doing his blue, and we pretty much got triple buffed every single game. And getting triple buffed back then, is it's not like it was now. The buff gave two or three times as much experience as any other jungle camp, so if you got three buffed, it was like, now you're just playing without a jungler for the majority of the game. So I think in every single game except for one, because we got a kill at level one in that game, we got three buffed, lost multiple camps, we got starved in 2v1. Uh, for me, it feels so powerless because it was really just their level one strategy and their macro in 2v1, and those were things that I didn't have a lot of knowledge about, especially level one jungle pathing and 2v1s. So it, it was I was playing the game and everything was just coming down, like, crashing around me. So it felt like I I never even had a chance to play the game in that series because we were just so heavily outclassed in every shape and form. Right at this point in time, so we're talking like late 2014. Now this is obviously end of season four. As an individual player, as just mid laner Bjergsen, did you actually think to yourself like you know I'm as good as any of these? Mid laners, I'm, I'm as good as Xpeke or Frogan or you know the people who you'd be compared to. I mean, obviously at this point in time they had better accomplishments. You know they had all the years extra playing the game. But did you actually think as you were as good as them as a player? Yeah, I thought individually and in terms of laning, I was just as good as pretty much any player that I faced. I didn't, I didn't think I was as smart as Pawn, and I didn't think that my champion pool was as deep as Pawn because our team was very limited in our strategies. So I was pretty much forced to play only control mages because when I was playing control mages, I would often be in the middle of the map and I would have a better outlook to kind of micro my teammates and and help them when they were lost and look at the ways. But when I was playing uh, assassins like Fizz, Zed, and, and Kassadin, I think mostly mostly Fizz and Kassadin, you're, you're on the side lane and you're more, I guess, selfish and, and focused on myself. So we ended up at a point where I could only play this very limited champion pool. So I felt like I was as good as the majority of them, but Pawn was the one that really stood out to me because I mean, he, he did things that were so basic, but it was kind of like the wave control and lane and how he used wards and how they would especially abuse the blind spots that I had when I warded. And it was like, no matter where I warded against this team, they would kill me. 
So I, I learned a lot from playing against Samson White and playing against uh, Pawn and Dandy. Since you said in these early days, like for example, when you first came to the team, I mean, it's quite natural if you're a young player and you get good. You you initially might have thought at times like, oh, I, I did my job well, you know, like oh maybe my teammates just aren't as good as Cloud Nines or whatever, you know, highs rather. Right? This is these are all natural things to think, you know. These are the ways people think as they're learning to be a pro, learning to be a teammate, etc. Yeah. Like, after this tournament where you got completely smashed by White like this, it was close winning LCS. Was it at all a worry to you going into season five that basically you kept the same team? I mean, amazing left out of choice and you got Centaur in. But actually at the time that looked like you know, sort of a fairly even trade, you know? I mean, people don't know that Centaur used to actually play like these the same types of champions actually that amazing did. You didn't really make like any big upgrade at any position. Were you fine with the teammates you had at the time? Hmm. I was a bit worried about whether Dyer still had it in him at that time because he wasn't a very communicative player and he was already hard enough when we had Lost Boy who barely spoke English. So I think at that time there, there was some talk about whether we could find a better suited top laner, but I think Andy talked to Dyer and he assured him that he's still really committed and he's going to work on all of his shortcomings. And I think I even talked to Dyer or we had a team meeting and I kind of got the feeling that he was still committed. It wasn't just that he didn't know what else to do and that's why he was playing, which is which is the feeling that you get from from some players back in the day. It's just, oh, well, I don't really have anything else to do, so I'm just going to keep being a pro. So, and that was pretty much the only thing cuz I, I felt like um Turtle could definitely still improve. Lost Boy was a good player. He just didn't he wasn't able to really communicate and he wasn't I guess willing to really speak his mind very much because he was very shy and he didn't want to disagree with people or confront people or have arguments. So he was often very quiet. He had good things to say, but you really had to, you really had to force it out of him. You really had to pull it out of him before he would really say anything. And amazing, obviously, went home because he missed his family. So I, I was a little worried about Dyrus going into season five, but overall, I was fairly confident in our roster because I, I thought Centauran was this really up and coming kind of prodigy jungler and it was nice to have another Dane in the house when you went to this IEM and it's the one where famously you won the tournament but I always say it like this like in a, in a way that's like kind of unfair because on the one hand this tournament had GE Tigers, the team that later became known as Rox Tigers, who at the mm -hmm. time were the number one team in the world. They were actually leading LCK and they were actually ahead of SK Telecom. And they had, it was famously when they were doing that Juggermore approach and they were looking actually unstoppable. And so the reason it's really unfair is because if you take part in a tournament that has the best Korean team and the best team in the world in and you win the tournament, you should get a lot of props for that. But in this tournament, the way it went, you didn't play SK, who was the top European team. They got eliminated by Flash Wolves and by this GE Tigers team. Mm. Then, so as a result, you played the Flash Wolves, who at the time weren't as famous as they are now. You know, People thought, oh, who cares about LMS teams? Then when you got to the final, obviously, because WE had upset GE Tigers, you beat WE, okay, cool, but they weren't at the time considered a very good team. And so in a bizarre way, even though you won this big tournament and a tournament that had a, a very good team in it and should have given you props, in a way... It felt like you didn't get the full props for it because it's not the same as beating GE Tigers in the final, right? So, was it what was the experience like for you? I mean, it's still an international tournament, so how did you kind of weigh it up? I mean, it still felt really good winning it, and we still beat CJ, even though it was best of yes. one. And they were still considered a pretty good team. They had yes, uh, yeah. Coco and Mad Life, and it was especially important to Lost Way because it was his old team. So, it still felt good, but even to me, it did feel cheapened a little bit because. When we, we played against W in the final and they didn't feel like a, a top caliber team, we had been scrimming GE Tigers. And they were, they were pretty freaking incredible. I mean, they weren't Samsung wide level. We could definitely beat them, but W wasn't near at that level. And to this day, I still don't know how they, they even won. I remember we had all our prep ready for W already. Loco was <laughs> yeah. already working on the draft. And then it's like, Jesus, somehow this Chinese team, that they were like the 10th team in China or something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they ended, up be, they ended up being yeah. pretty good once they came back yes. because they picked up Xie, who's now like one of the best players in China. But yeah, I mean, I was still proud of the achievement, but it didn't feel it, it didn't feel like 
the the same it would if we had beaten G Tigers. But I remember that my family was there. It was one of the first tournaments where my brother and my dad was there. So it was kind of especially important for me to win in front of them. So I didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about, oh, we didn't beat G Tigers because, you know, we, we beat the teams that beat the other teams. And my family was there. So it was still a good experience for me. People, it wasn't that long after this, I think it was only maybe like three weeks or something after this, that the end of the first LCS split for season five came along. And this is where you got to rematch again against Cloud9. Admittedly, at this point in time, like they, they weren't as dominant a team in the regular split and all that sort of stuff. What was winning the second championship like, going back to back? Jeez, I don't even remember that. Oh, oh, I remember this one. It's where I played AP Cho. I didn't... NA was just really weak at this point in time. I don't remember if C9 made a roster change, but I think they had some internal problems. And it was just obvious that the, the teams weren't really, they weren't really pushing us to learn. They were just kind of falling over to our individual skill. Like Centaur was a really good mechanical jungler. Darius still had a very favorable meta for him, and he was still outplaying the top laners 1v1. And it just kind of felt like it was similar to Season 4. We were better individual players in every single role. And we just kind of rolled over every team. So this final didn't feel even a fraction as good as the first one because the first one was really blood, sweat, and tears going into it. But this was no much easier to win. Since people obviously know after this comes MSI and that was its own debacle that we'll get into in a second, since people know that, they're going to think that this question I pose now is, is pointless. But let, what about this? What if the day after the LCS finals... Then we held some sort of international tournament. It's just the very next day, in whatever form you're in, at IEM and at this LCS finals, you just then you get to play against the best Koreans and the Chinese teams. Was TSM actually at the time one of the best teams in the world? Would you have done well? No, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think it, we were in this little NA box where people were playing our own meta, and Korea was playing the game in a much more optimal way. They were playing champions like Cassiopeia and Azir, and I remember trying them and not feeling like they were very good. And oh, you know, they they must not understand the meta as well as I did because at that time we were winning a lot. So obviously my ego was getting bigger. So once we came internationally and their play style was better, their champion pools were better, and they were better in just pretty much every single way. So it was a big wake up call, and I think. Especially the biggest lesson for me was kind of showing more respect towards other regions, especially Korea, since they have been the most dominant region, and really respecting the way they play the game and the champions they play, because they they play them for a reason. And I really learned that in that tournament, because my partially because Loco wanted me to play certain champions, but even the champions I wanted to play it didn't align with their meta, and I, I just I was too blindsided by my own. Uh, I guess my own um, ignorance to to see how much better their way of playing the game was. So that was a big lesson that I took away from MSI. It's just how ignorant I was going into the tournament. Sure. So as I alluded to, obviously after this, we kind of did get to see what would happen. But admittedly, there was some meta switch stuff that happened. And this is one of the issues that leads into it is we had the MSI and at this tournament... It was a couple of details. Like, it's one thing if you just lose to the Koreans and you lose to the Chinese team. What, like, that can happen. It has happened many times in international history to many top teams. But the big shock, obviously, was that this is one of the first tournaments where LMS region actually did well. They made the playoffs and famously at TSM didn't even make the playoffs at this MSI. And mm. then we had all the context where you seemed like you were in this little bubble that didn't interact with the rest of the world's metas because you you and Loco came into the tournament like, right, we're going to be playing Cho'Gath and uh, Urgot and this is my champion pool. And then everyone else was like, as we said, like Cassiopeia, Ari, like they were just, you know, they were popping off. Everyone was looking great, all the mid laners at this tournament. And I mean, we have a saying in English, like you, you got egg on your face. You, it was kind of embarrassing, right? What happened at this tournament for you, right? Yeah, I I mean, I think we we had this very singular strategy of playing through bottom, and it, we felt like the whole game was revolved around playing around bot. Which sounds weird because people always think that TSM played around mid, but if you look at MSI, it was the in between the playoffs that we won and MSI, we switched our whole play style to playing around bottom and playing 
strong winning lanes, playing Callista, playing any bot, and just doing everything in our power to four man, five man dive bot and get the tower. But then when we came to MSI, the bot lanes were playing so smart. They understood, you know, wave management, uh, even backing off tower once we're setting up the dive. And these stupidly basic things just weren't things that we experienced uh, in NA. So my champion pool, like, uh, I was playing like Ziggs because Ziggs was all about just playing safe, and I was able okay, to con- yeah. I was able to contribute to diving bot lane. And uh, just our entire strategy was revolved around that. And when that didn't work, it just you know we were just in chaos. We didn't know what to do. It was the only way we knew how to play. So we just had to commit to that play style, and it just did not work. It was awful. Did it did it affect your confidence at all? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. know. It kind of affected my confidence, but mostly I was just really mad because <laughs> I wanted more resources. I wanted to get a chance to to show what I could do. But Loco's decision was that the game was best played around bottom, and that's just how we should play. So obviously that hurt my ego quite a bit. And once we started losing in MSI, I got very frustrated because I felt like it was out of my control because we were we had this singular play style that wasn't working anymore. And I had pretty much had zero synergy with uh Centaurian at that time because he had one place I was just full clear and look for something around bot lane. So I was really frustrated and upset with Loco especially. That's kind of where our our coach player relationship started taking a bad turn I think. So this is obviously the tournament where you got to play a, an official game against Faker in on the international stage. Right? I know like Whenever people do interviews and you mention Faker, right? In an interview, I get it that people are supposed to, I mean, you're supposed to sort of, if you want to have a good PR <coughs> image, you're supposed to say things like, no, no, he's the best, obviously, because, you know, he's won the world championships and the titles. So naturally, if you notice in sports, he's supposed to sort of give it up to the person with more accomplishments. But mm-hmm. the problem I always had with a lot of those interviews is as someone who's done a lot of interviews, I can sort of tell when people are giving a PR answer like that and when people actually believe it. And I have to say, a lot of Western players, not just even the middle in many roles, when they said all this stuff, that's actually what they really believed as well. They all, they did actually think Faker had some like magical aura around him, you know, and, you know, you could be a good player, but you, no one could be as good as Faker. People kind of did buy into this mystique. So what I wanted to know was this, like when you actually played against him, did you actually think just to, just for yourself, not publicly? Did you actually think like I could be as good as this guy? Because that's what I always used to say was the reason why it actually always bummed me out that Froggen actually never got to play against him. Because actually, knowing Froggen's personality, and especially I mean, people now maybe know it a little bit, but he he privately is a very confident person. So I actually know that he secretly in his own brain, even if he said an interview, yeah, Faker, he actually probably thinks he could beat Faker. So did you actually think when you went against him, like yeah, I could I could I could beat this guy? Anyone can be beaten. Did you really believe it? Um. If, if Loco would actually, I mean, this is one of the things that I actually appreciated from Loco that he kind of, he told me from the beginning that if I am to be faker or beat someone on, the, on that caliber, I can't put them on a pedestal. I have to believe that I'm better or that I can be better and that I can beat them in that game. And that was kind of something that had been, you know, there's no such thing as sports psychology or, or mental training or everything was, was kind of on their own. And that was one of the first things that someone had told me that actually resonated with me and something that I knew I had to change about myself. Uh, playing against Faker and Scrims, he, he's just kind of playing really cocky and like really stupid. I remember I solo killed him in a scrim and I was like shaking. It was the best, the best day of my life. But I didn't feel like, I, in that scrim at least, I couldn't feel like he was that caliber player. I kind of felt like he was that caliber of player, but it had really gotten to his head to a point where he was playing extremely cocky. But it was also a weird circumstance because we were screaming them, but we were also playing them in the tournament. So, of course, everyone was playing a little weird or playing different champions or, or hiding strategies. So my, my first experience playing against Faker was just that he was extremely, extremely cocky. But I, I did feel like I could play yeah. it to his level. Yeah. So, okay, the, in, when you say that, if when since you obviously, especially at other international tournaments over the years, you've had chances to play him since, you know, when teams aren't in your group, you can scrim against those teams. Does Faker actually in scrims do all the shit that he does? I mean, funnily enough, in official games and on stream, does he really do all the like mad outplays all the time and go for like, you know, like the tiniest gap where you can do a flash into someone's tower and try and kill him at the, early in the game? Does he, do, does he actually do all that stuff in scrims as well? Uh, he, he does push your buttons a lot. He plays really, really aggressive and I feel like he kind of tests you. He really puts you to the test. I remember season five or season six, I don't remember, but 
he would just do this thing where he for every single CS he would pretty much stand on top of my minions and he would just walk back and forth and he's pretty much just saying like you know th- throw a skill shot at me try to hit me and if you miss then he then you have to give up the minions or give up XP or you have to take damage for free so he was putting the lane in a state where you're forced to fight him because he's putting himself in your face and you're forced to fight him that's also partially why I, I thought he was so cocky because he was he was playing such a crazy play style that I hadn't really experienced before but it was very fun. It's very arena like, you know, it's kind of this how you how you think the mid lane is like. It's this one v one and you're forced to fight him or you're gonna lose lane slowly. So I, I enjoy playing against him a lot, but yeah. He I think he plays a lot crazier in scrims than he does on stage, but maybe that's how he learns by testing his limits and seeing what he can get away with. But I, I also think that if you if you shrink in the face of that pressure, then when you go on stage, you're you're just completely done mentally going up against a player like Faker. If he plays that way and he plays in your face and he either outplays you or you play too scared or he just straight up beats you by having better mechanics, then I think that can really mess you up when you go to play against him in an official match. Uh, you alluded to the fact that this MSI was where some of the relationship with you and Loco started to have trouble, started to break down to some degree. And again, this, this just sh- it just shows how interesting it is when you, when you succeed in the playoffs, people just tend to forget what happened in the regular split because in the summer split this time in season five was the worst one ever for TSM. This was where you'd finished in like fifth place. Like it, at the time, actually, people will forget this. It was looking like you would lose even earlier in the playoffs than the final. To even make mm-hmm. the final actually was a pretty good result. And at the time, especially, I remember from the outside, it looked like these were a lot of games where you really did have to almost like 1v5 and just carry the game sometimes because the team was in a bad state, right? So what, what were the problems in TSM at the time? Whew. Oh, that was a lot of problems. There's definitely uh, my and Loco's relationship was pretty destructive at that time. I remember there was a lot of, I guess, arguments or discussion around Centaur and not being willing to take risks and not uh, kind of understanding that to some degree you have to take risk in the game. He he had the mentality of if I'm weaker or if my champion is weaker at this time of the game and I look for a gank, if the jungler is there by some chance and he's there to counter gank, then we're going to lose. So I, I won't take that risk. But then it was just kind of a problem when we would start to fall behind in games. We weren't willing to take any risk and therefore we would just slowly lose. And I think the other thing, I guess a, a big personal problem that I had was that our Centaur and I were getting singled out a lot by the community and I was still really young at the time. It was especially in the form of Dyrus would die a lot or he would get camped a lot and then Centaur and I would take the blame for sacking Dyrus and putting him on an island and yes. only ganking mid and TSM only ganks mid but what people didn't understand at the time is that Dyrus just wasn't able to communicate around resources. He wasn't able to anticipate when the enemy top laner is stacking wave and he's going to get dove and he wasn't able to synergize with Centaurin and play well around top. But personally, I, I, I still had that young mentality of I wanted to please everyone. I wanted everyone to like me. I I wanted to be uh, you know generally liked by the community, but at the same time, I didn't want to out one of my teammates at the time because that's just not something you do. You don't publicly shame your teammate like that. But that was a big problem I dealt with uh, just feeling like the community was against me for something that was out of my control. And also with that, I kind of felt like it uh, it enabled Dyrus to not try as hard and not to try to fix his issues as much because you have these weaknesses and, and I, I think your teammates and coach tells you you have these weaknesses. But if you read online that it's your teammates sacking you, it's 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 not your fault. It's just your teammates not playing around you. I don't know how he thought at the time, but I felt like he wasn't taking as much responsibility because the community was taking all that responsibility away from him because he was such a legend. So I, those were some of the, those three uh, were some pretty big issues that we had at the time. And our team pretty much didn't get along very well socially. Lost Boy didn't speak much English. I got along with uh, Turtle pretty well, but for everyone else, I don't think many of us had very tight friendships or relationships. So it was really hard for us to deal with this, these problems too. In terms of like how your vision of the game matched up with Locos at this point in time, 
Right, one thing I will give Loco credit for, because it's going to sound like I'm going to be critical when I say this, is one of the reasons why he has always been someone who famously will always argue with me about the fact that, like, Flame's overrated, like, stop saying he's the best top laner, is because Loco is one of those people who has, like, the... I would just describe it as the global meta approach to League of Legends. He thinks there's like a correct way to play at some point in time. Oftentimes he does watch LCK, etc. you know, and he, he's, he actually is one of those guys, at least to me, who seems like he thinks it's things like, right, it's having the right champions. It's knowing the correct decisions that makes you win the game. It's not necessarily about you've got this star player or you've got this, you know, the top half of the map stronger than the bottom in your team or whatever. He thinks there's like a correct way to play. But at this point in time, as I've said, some of these games did kind of look like... I mean, this is actually, I think, when people started to call you, like, Brother Bjergsen on Inven or whatever. Like, there were a ton of these games in the regular split where you had to just hard carry to get in, to get a win in the game when TSM didn't look very good with the macro, etc. Was there, like, a disconnect in this sense? Like, if like if Loco's coaching you? Like, on paper, you don't want to say this as a teammate, but, like, I'm kind of the main reason we're winning some of these games and I am the star player, so can I have my pick and can we play through mid... Was was there like a disconnect there where local was sort of like no no we're supposed to do this and we're gonna the team's gonna do this or we're gonna play you on these champions was there was there like a di- conflict of interest between the two of you like you had different visions of the game? I think not as much in regards to champions because that was a obviously a big problem at MSI and End of Spring like I said so that's something we actually came to agree to and it was more so me being more open to also local suggestions and seeing what people are playing in other regions but. At this time, I had grown more confident in myself and quite a lot more disagreeable, and I was very willing to to argue on things. I think I was heavily influenced by like amazing Loco Andy because these are very disagreeable people that are willing to speak their mind. Pretty and, stubborn, right? Yeah, I was pretty stubborn as well, and because I I felt like that's that's kind of how you improve is you have to either change someone's mind or or come into a middle ground, but you don't get anywhere by not discussing things. But I, yeah, with Loco. I think there, there was just a big problem of always wanting to be right, like Loco wanting to be right or me wanting to be right or, or someone else. And we would always just go into hypotheticals. Like we, we would have this scenario that we're talking about in the post game review. And then, oh, but what if we have this champion? And what if it's this? Or what if it's slightly different? You know, we would just go away from the reality of the game and, and add all these levels of complexities that were unnecessary. So we ended up having just a lot of stupid arguments. But I don't know if Loco necessarily had like a perf- perfectionistic view of playing the game, but I didn't agree with a lot of his kind of, I guess, his leadership as a coach or his authority or how he was acting as an authority as a coach. But he taught me a lot of good concepts around like playing around team power spikes and understanding team comps and making plans and things like that. So I think Loco definitely taught me some valuable things. When you, uh, like to tie into what we were talking about at the beginning of the interview, like uh, who you were as a person before League of Legends and then <laughs> growing into this role of not just being a good player, but being a teammate and then eventually obviously taking on a leadership role. Did uh, becoming really good at League of Legends, was that directly something that built up your confidence as a person? Did you kind of, was that kind of like the thing that you rested your self esteem on in a way? Yeah. <laughs> I remember telling one of my friends at the time that just genuinely I felt like League of Legends was the only thing I was good at. And he's like, ah, no, don't say that type of stuff. But that's how I felt. There was one thing I was good at and that was League. And that's why I committed so much of my time to it. But I think it was kind of a building block for me to build myself as a person and build other skills because I came to realize that the way I'm applying myself to the game, my hard work, my diligence, the way I think critically of the game, I can apply that to other things in life and other things that I want to learn. And so I think that my confidence kind of grew out of league. Because here's Cause, the thing. Because like, it was the first oh, thing sorry. I was actually decent at. Yeah, sorry. Because because the, the thing is, when people, <clears throat> right, first of all, literally everyone gets criticized. Like even Faker 
gets criticized mm -hmm. some of the times when he then won the the split or won the world championship you know everyone because because even because obviously if you're a great player they just make the expectations even higher so anytime you're not reaching that expectation level it's understandable it's human nature as to why people would want to criticize you know because if you see someone who's way better than you well the one thing you can do as a random player is just be like ah oh, but you still failed in that way you know so it's understandable that everyone will get criticism but i noticed the way you got criticism is something I've seen quite a lot actually, where what there's almost like a playbook as to how it works. So if, for example, you'd stayed as the person you were when you started in League of Legends, that would have been the criticism. People would have been like, oh, he's too soft, you know, he doesn't have like the killer instinct or whatever. That was what people would say. But then if you get the killer instinct, then if you're not the most outgoing person and you're not, you know, amazing at charisma, then what they do is they just say, oh, arrogant, just aloof, you know, thinks he's better than everyone. Like, but yeah. in a way, isn't this sort of like, it's kind of like a natural way to develop as a person, right? Because especially at this point in time when the team roster was having some issues and it wasn't the best team necessarily, some players obviously literally retired and never played again after this. So the writing was kind of on the wall that changes need to happen. If you are one of the best pieces of the team and you're in your prime as an individual player, it's kind of understandable that you're going to sort of be like, well... One way I do know how we can win is if people give me what I want. If, if, you, if you guys do what I say, we have a chance to win. It's kind of logical, right? Yeah, but I don't think at the time I had any good knowledge of how the other roles really worked or how they should use their roles to win the game. That's kind of but, something I learned like, towards the end of season five. Did you have unrealistic expectations about what the jungler should do for you in the top laner and stuff? I don't think I had unrealistic expectations as much as... I just didn't, I couldn't tell them exactly what they needed to do better and I couldn't help them grow because I didn't have that kind of knowledge of any other role. So season six, I kind of made it a big thing of spending a lot of time talking to my teammates about how they see their roles, uh, how jungle pathing works, like when do you need to be farming, when do you need to be ganking and just having a shared game knowledge so that I can use that to help my teammates make better decisions. But in season five, I didn't really have that. So once my teammates started performing poorly, weren't trying as hard, were obviously really burnt out. We were like, Lust Boy and Dyrus were insanely burnt out, you wouldn't imagine. I, I just, it, rather than extending myself and trying to help them, I just kind of went into my shell and made sure that I was performing well individually. When you went for the summer season five split finals and this was the one where famously it was the first time there was a huge location for the final it was in madison square garden there was all this hype around it then you look at the fact it was the first time clg had ever made the finals that's obviously like a classic rivalry reignited you know people were really looking forward to this match but obviously this is a game where they swept tsm and they just cleanly beat them and actually, again, this is actually another quite rubbish final, actually. And I know in this is the luxury of being in TSMs. You can actually be like, yeah, that was one of my bad finals. You know, I won most of the other ones. You know, I've got a lot of trophies. Whereas, you know, for some people's career, like making the final once is the story. You know, I'd be like half the interview. So I realized it was very easy to skip past this. But when you went into this final, I, I think when I talked to Dyrus about this, I think he even admitted that he was sort of like, <laughs> he was kind of iffy. Like he thought you probably weren't going to win the final and like, CLG was better and, you know, maybe you shouldn't even made this far. Did you actually yourself think, no, no, we can win this one as well. Like, you know, I can outperform when I play. We can, did you think TSM would win this one? I thought we had a chance because at this time, it was actually a time where Loco kind of came to the conclusion that we should be playing around mid because I was the most consistent player and the others just didn't have good understanding of their matchups or, or the meta. So, I, I, going into that series, I think more than in other series, I felt like it was really, we were going to win or lose on my shoulders. And that's a lot of pressure, but at the same time, I saw it as a good opportunity to grow. But once we came on stage, it was, I think especially since they ended up 2v1ing us a lot, and 2v1 was something that I had no control over and I had no knowledge over. So I don't know if they did that intentionally, but it really messed with our whole flow as a team because we were much better playing standard lanes and it's standard lanes i felt like I, I had more control over the game as a mid laner obviously the mid laner doesn't participate in 2v1 pretty much at all so when we came on stage and we played 2v1 almost every game we just fell apart completely it was almost like playing against samsung white where in in the early games in 2v1 we just had a deficit every single game because 
I don't know if it was Afro or, or Six Lol or whoever, but their 2v1 strategies were just so much more advanced than ours. So, got ripped apart in that one. It's not, not a great memory. If you think back on the LCS finals you didn't win, like the one against Cloud9 and then this one here against CLG, and obviously the next one against CLG, are you a guy where it's easy to just like forget about them and just move on to the next one? If you, like if I, if I ask you about them now, do you still get a bit tilted at losing them? No, I wouldn't say that they affect me to this point because I think I've I had time after to kind of sit back and reflect and think about what I should take away from these experiences and move on because there's no point in spending too much time dwelling on that. But in the moment, it obviously really hurt, especially Madison Square Garden and especially the game we lost in the fifth game, the match we lost in the fifth game against CLG were in 2016 spring with my new roster. That one was really painful because it was such a close series and you can call me cocky or arrogant, but I felt it was similar to me against Hai. I was playing against Huhi, and I just felt like I was a much better player than Huhi at that time. And I think in the series I performed better too, but uh, it was an extremely close series, and they came out on top. But I was feeling pretty destroyed after that because it was it was my roster, it was the roster that I had built, and we weren't able to win. And, I, and that one that was probably the finals that we lost that I felt the most blame or I took the most responsibility for, I, w- I would say. So that's probably why it hit me the hardest because I felt like I could think of 10 different things that I could have done for me to influence us to actually win the series. Whereas the two times we got 3 out, it just felt so out of my hands. We were so outclassed. So the one in, where was it? In Vegas, was uh, it was extra painful. At the end of season five, so you had the the LCS finals ended with a sweep. Then there was the Worlds. I mean, there's not even really any point going in that one. Like the group was already like ridiculous group of death draw, where even like the bad team in your group was Origin, who obviously everyone knows was actually really good. So, I, I don't think it mattered what group we were in. Exactly. Honestly, we were so terrible. Well, this is kind of what I'm getting to. Is like it not not only in terms of like metaphorically, but in a literal sense, the writing was on the wall that this lineup's definitely going to change. Because on the one, like I mean, if you remember, it was even leaked that Dyrus was going to retire at the end of the Worlds before the before Oof. the tournament even finished. That you know? was really that was a big problem in the team because I, I just it was so hard for me to have those 14 hour days grinding in Korea, and I look over and I see Lost Boy being burnt out. I know he's going to retire. I look at Darius, he's already announced his retirement and it's extremely hard to to put in so much effort and looking around and knowing that my teammates have pretty much already given up. So that was really hard on me as well. The thing that's a killer, right, is this is an example of where actually I can I I can actually prove now with this question that I never actually was biased against TSM. Like, I obviously, yes, definitely played with the fact that, like, if TSM fans talk shit to me, I'm going to talk mad shit back to them, just because that's my personality. <laughs> and then, obviously, yes, I did think it was funny any time that Loco and Reggie failed, but that's just for personal reasons, you know. But actually, TSM, the team, I always tried to be... Well, it's like any team. I tried to be fair with the analysis, etc. And I have to say... Bearing in mind things were going really badly in the regular split of this next split where you've got this new lineup and this new coach, etc. I actually think this is one of the rare examples of where even though the results were looking really bad, I actually felt really bad for Reginald and TSM because in the off season, I actually thought he killed it. It looked like he made all the perfect moves. He got yeah. double lift at exactly the right time where, you know, he's still stocks very high as an individual player, but, you know, he's got that thing of like, oh, he's not a good teammate. That's exactly when you want to get a superstar player. Then you've got the scenario where you got Yellow Star. And at the time, we all thought after season five Fnatic, Yellow, we thought the Yellow Star was like, the Western matter or something, you know, we thought, oh my God, he's a genius shot caller and he can do yeah. anything and look what he's done with Reckless and Lit. You know, everyone thought this is the perfect lineup and then you add in, you've got, okay, so we didn't know who Casey Woodbook was, but this is exactly <laughs> what everyone's been telling Reginald for years. It's like, stop being so hands-on, you know, let someone else be a coach. Also, get a coach who isn't just a, an analyst, you know, or get someone who can be a, a head coach and be an authority fit. It looked like Reginald did everything right in the off-season and then, the season was the split was just going so terribly, wasn't it? So, what was this like? Because it sounds like if, if you had all these frustrations at the end of season five, if I, if someone comes to me and tells me you've done all these things, I'd be like, "This is the dream." Now is when I now I can win everything, right? Yeah, I, I think there's a, just a huge 
adjustment period because we had to learn how to work with the new coaching staff, learn how to work with the new players. Obviously, the coaching staff wasn't what we hoped they would be. I think George is a good guy, but it was obvious that he had a an analyst position, kind of like a, a sort of a positional coach, you know, doing a lot of math, doing a lot of almost slave work for the players. He wasn't a leader or a coach or leading reviews, and that became obvious really quickly. And it was just really hard for us to find a good team dynamic because Yellowstar told me that he he came in, well, he didn't tell me this at the beginning, but he told me later on that he kind of came into TSM and he didn't want to be, he didn't want to impose himself as a leader and and take over, I guess, my role or... or Isn't that what the, you wanted though? Yeah, exactly. That was what Doublet and I thought. We thought he wanted to come in and he was going to shock all and he was going to lead because... I mean, I, I was I was humble about the idea because he had gone further than me. He he had proved that he was a better player or he had better game knowledge. He took his team further than I ever had. So I had a lot of respect for him. But there was just this clash of expectations between the players where Yellowstar didn't want to step on anyone's toes. He didn't want to be too authoritative. And we were trying to give him space to do that. So... That was just a big problem, and the way we really kind of came together as a team was just, I don't know if Yellowstar, I mean, him working together with Peter was not good. Their play styles did not clash. If you remember Yellowstar and Reckless, their lane was pretty much just just don't feed and yes. do your job as a team, but Peter didn't want to have any part of that. Peter wanted to take risks. He wanted to you know, take trades when the gentleman is not on the map and you know, just hope he's not here, and if he's here, then it just sucks. We took the risk, and it didn't work out. But Yellowstar did not want to take any of those risks. He was a very risk averse player and he just wanted to go 50 50 in lane no matter the matchup and play for the team. And I think when we reached the point where we understood this misunderstanding within the team, Boras' confidence was just crushed because Peter was really, he was hard on him because they, they just didn't match his personality or as players at all. So it reached a point where Peter and I had a talk and, and we told each other, like, if this team is going to do well, it's going to be on our shoulders. So we just need to step the fuck up and carry this team and be the leaders that this team needs us to have. Because I felt like it was not the same Yellow Star as it was in Fnatic. I, re- I felt like he maybe was part of the new environment. Maybe he didn't feel at home. His confidence was definitely hurt quite a bit by, by Peter and, and career, the losses. I, mean, I, like, I believe at the time he yeah. already... You know, speculated on whether he wanted to retire, etc. So maybe he just thought, yeah, like, I'm also not the big salary. I'm also not how sure or how what his intentions were of coming to NA, and if sure. it was just to to sell out. I, I didn't feel that exactly from him, but I can tell towards the end of the split, it, it wasn't the fanatic yellow star that was going to lead the team. So the way we kind of came out on top was that Peter and I decided that this team was going to live or die by by us as players and leaders and. We were going to take it upon our shoulders to help our teammates grow, make sure they're doing the right thing. And I think that was around the time we worked with Weldon too, and he yes. helped us facilitate that. And that's kind of how we started being not complete garbage. When Doublelift joined the team, a lot of the things you've described about what was going on in TSM, what was going on with you in your career, sounds like Doublelift's story where, you know, he had to go into a team where eventually he had to become a leadership figure and then he was the star player. And then oftentimes the conflict with him and his coaches or his teammates was always the idea of like, you know, oh, I'll do the team concept, but if it, if it fails, then well, at least I can carry. So everyone do what I want. You know, it's kind of the similar yeah. story. Did, did you have a, a connection in that sense when he joined the team? Did you, did you see someone who had a similar background to you? Yeah, I think, I think we got a long pretty well from the beginning because we're both just very driven and we care a lot about winning and we were both at a time where we were willing to discuss and and disagree with each other and have strong opinions so that kind of led to me having a lot of good conversations with Peter and him being willing to just sit down and talk about the game and talk about the team and and even he would be he was one of the first players of my teammates that would just tell me when I did something that he felt like was wrong or I built an item that he felt like wasn't good or I placed my pink board in a bad spot and I had never experienced a, a teammate that was looking at... I think at some point I'm sure that was part of why he was so toxic because he was so focused on his teammates and perhaps he wasn't bringing it up in a nice way. But I wanted that kind of feedback. Blunt. Yeah, I, I had been craving that kind of feedback and okay. even though he was blunt, it was... 
very appreciated and it was a skill that I kind of took on myself after that and I still try to use it's just you know your your teammates are never going to be aware of of everything that they're doing and they're never going to be perfect and giving them suggestions on on what they're doing can be really helpful so I think that's part of why we grew a good bond from the beginning is just he was willing to tell me what he didn't think was good and he was willing to give me new ideas and if if he was wrong and I was able to articulate that that would make me smarter because I was able to now I understand better why I'm doing the things that I'm doing and why it's right. And if you change my mind, then that's even better. So uh, that was one of the best things about playing with Peter. Obviously, people know within TSM, there's often been this issue of whether or not the coach, whoever it is at the time, is like a leadership figure. Because, you know, in the early days, especially League of Legends, a lot of coaches were just analysts, basically. Like the title yeah. was kind of a misnomer. And especially in TSM, people obviously more, know. More like, a, more like a drafter than a coach, yeah. Yeah, sure. And people know, especially obviously within the TSM, or Reginald's kind of the big authority figure. And if things happen, he comes in and everyone's seen the fame. I mean, my joke was always like, it's like he's like the side character on a TV show. You just wait, oh, what episode's he going to be in? You know, that's what the reality show was like. Yeah. So was was kind of what you explained before was since Path obviously literally fits that bill. Like he is someone who he never he never even applied to be a coach. He was an analyst, and then they sort of just said to him, "You have to be the coach now because you know it's the, everything's gone wrong in the split." Was was this aspect you talked about with Doublelift, where the two of you sort of took responsibility, like we're going to be the leaders? Was it just that way with that core for the whole time? Were you kind of the the actual leaders of the team overall? Yeah, we we pretty much had to be because Path was not. He was not a, a leadership character. He had a he had a hard time being assertive, and it was something that he was working on throughout his whole time being a coach. But yeah, like you said, he was kind of thrown in the position, and the first thing that he really wanted to focus on was because his game knowledge wasn't amazing, but he was willing to put in a lot of work, and he was very, I guess, fact focused. He was very good at helping with builds and doing math, and he was pretty much just a, a really good analyst but he didn't have the capabilities of a coach. And when he came in, his his main focus was doing as well in draft as he could. So it, it was kind of left on double S and I to uh, do the best to lead the team in, in review and help them learn and to some degree help with the direction of the team, even though that's as Parth got better as a drafter, he would slowly uh, work on, on more and more skills as a coach. But in the especially in the beginning, a lot of that was on our shoulders too. So something people often forget about this split, the first split with this lineup, is that because CLG won the split, yes, very narrowly, and then obviously went and had that amazing result at MSI where they made it to the final, people forget that actually CLG wasn't like the best team at the time. In fact, this was the split where obviously the infamous Immortals, Huni and Rainover lineup came along and they were wrecking everyone in the regular split and then they were supposed to oh, be yeah. on paper win the split. But people forget it was your team that played them in that semifinals and just swept them, 3 0 them. So... What happened to allow you to just crush this team that before that looked unbeatable, basically? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it really started when, like I said, Peter and I took a lot of responsibility and that's kind of when we started to grow as a team. And well, then coming in and helping our team made a big difference because he kind of, he forced us to spend a lot more time together and, and get to know each other and, and grow that bond. And I think that helped with being able to be honest with each other and be harsh on each other at times and people actually being able to take that because uh, in the end they know that each player wanted the best for each other. So I think it really was like it was like the team just snapped and we were all of a sudden a completely different team. And once you start getting some wins and once you start showing results in scrims or at least showing that we're improving, it gives everyone a lot of confidence because our confidence was in the gutter during the split when we were so horrible. So once we actually started uh, doing well, I think it's just kind of like a positive snowball. You know, we changed up some things in our environment. It was working well. We were performing well in scrims. We went on stage. We beat C9. We got more confidence, and it just led to a point where when we went in facing Immortals, I don't think anyone felt like we were even a close resemblance to the team that we was two weeks before because we had just made so much progress. Whereas if we had played them two weeks earlier, we would have felt quite differently, I think. Okay. When you... Um, 
Okay, in this particular lineup of TSM, obviously the big names are Bjergsen and Doblev. These are two of the most famous NALCS names, star player names, etc. So the guy in your team that actually had the smallest name when he joined was Hortzer, because obviously he'd only had that time when he was in Gravity, which wasn't like a top team. And so as a result, you know, he kind of had that rep of like, yeah, pretty good up and coming player, you know, and not the best team, but, you know, let's see what he does in the future. What What is his kind of... Um, how did he fit into TSM as a team? Because when I look at his style of play, it does seem like the perfect style of play to add. Because if you have Bjergs and you have double lift, you are going to want to play a lot of the games around them and let them be the carries and let them have a lot of the focus. And you probably do want someone who's like a, I mean, the joke at the time is kind of accurate, like a, a much better version of Dyrus or a, a not worn out version of Dyrus, whichever one you want to go with. So how did he fit into the squad? Was it as simple as uh -huh. that internally? No, it's not really the way Kevin is. He's not, he wasn't the type of person that was just wanted to sit on the back line and play tank and be a carry. He's a player in the whole history where I've known that he, he wants to shine and he wants to get resources and he wants to, he's hungry to prove himself. So it, it wasn't just like, oh, Kevin, you're, you're fine with playing tanks, right? It was just, I think the meta at the time was just tanks and Peter was obviously very hungry for resources. So that's just how, the game ended up playing, and I know that during a lot of those times, Kevin was pretty unhappy with how we were playing as a team, but in the end, it's what got us results, and I think everyone likes winning more than than losing by playing a play style that you would rather play. So he was willing to compromise at that time because we just had the most success playing around mid and bot. Okay. Was it good for him then that he got the split where double lift wasn't in the team, and so he kind of, I mean, people notice he got to play a lot more carries in that one and kind of like... Be more of the stars. Was that good for his for his mentality then? So he didn't get burned out. Yeah, I think it helped him step out of his shell and be more assertive. He has a very I mean, Kevin thinks highly of himself. He thinks he's a good player. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I'm sure you've seen in interviews where he says, "I'm the best, I'm the best top player in the world," or "I'm gonna be the best top player in the world, and we can beat anyone. We're gonna make semis." He's just a very confident person, and I think. He, he felt like he had more space to be himself and, and put himself out there. And it was very helpful for me because I had a very professionistic view of the game and I was very focused on kind of the steps on the game, the vision game and playing around waves. But Kevin did a good job of taking over double of skill of just just being willing to, even if he didn't, if I didn't have all the factors in my head, I had a hard time making the decision. But Cam was just like, you know, this might work, so let's just freaking do this. And that helped us learn. It was something that back then I, I struggled to do a lot. I struggled to just make a decision without having kind of the perfect information to do so. In that summer was the one where we still had the best of three formats. So you got to play a lot of games. And your team was insanely dominant in this one. Like pretty much uh, it, it was it was a kind of a joke that you you lost even like one series towards the end i can't remember it was against yeah, p1 in this, in this scenario was this just like the perfect split was everything internally as great as it looked from the outside i mean it, basically this is what people expected if you put double lift and bjergsen and these sorts of players in the same team mm. i think internally it was good in the beginning, but obviously the more we kept winning, the more egos grew and the, the less focused I feel like people were and they wanted to play more for themselves and less as a team, even though the way we the way we became this team that was winning was because people we reached a point where people were willing to sacrifice themselves for the greater good of the macro or the team. But you know, once you start winning, people they they care more about shining than winning, because you're already winning. So what more can you do? You can you can be the carrier. You can be the guy that gets the credit. So, I think that was that was the problem that started arising once we were winning a lot, and it was kind of the internal structure that we were dealing with, internal problems yeah. that we were dealing with. If we take out what happened at Worlds, was this lineup of TSM the one that won a bunch of splits, and at this point in time was in very very dominant? Do you think this was the best TSM you're on? Uh. I think the the roster, I'm not sure, but I would say the level of play that we were at compared to where everyone else was at, it's been the best of the teams that I've been on. But not necessarily. I think still my current team right now, even though we lost against Clutch, we would 
roll over 2016 TSM because the game just progresses so much. But I think if, if you take our team, the way we were in contrast to everyone's level at that point in time, that it was the best, the best team I've been on, yeah. Right. I, again, I'll refer back to what I said earlier in the interview. When you've been to, when you've won as many LCS titles and you've been to as many worlds as you have, you actually can breeze through some of them. They can't all just be dissected in depth. So as bizarre as it is, I'm going to stack together 2016 and 2017 worlds. But for obvious reasons, they have very similar storylines. So it all goes yeah. to shit on the last game. Obviously, you even, I mean, it's almost like you're, it's a meme because you're even playing like the same fucking champions in these last games. The same sort of way to lose in these games. You, you had the lead in all the groups before the second half of the games. They, there are similarities between them, right? They're clearly what, something to do with what happened in these worlds. Can't just have been the opposing teams and these the Something psychological yeah. happened to TSM, right? I, f- I feel like 2017 was worse, for sure. If you watch the game, sure, it's the same result, and it came down to one game in the same way. But I think the way we lost in 2017 was worse, in, in my opinion. And I was a lot a lot more angry after 2017 Worlds, to be honest, because I was just so disappointed in the way we played. At least in, in 2016, I felt like, we had a chance to go far and we had a chance to do well. And <clears throat> even in the games we lost, a lot of them were pretty close. And I think a lot of it came down to us not just understanding matchups or understanding the meta very well. Like there was an infamous uh, Mata Alistar game where he just completely rolled over us because our bot lane meta was, we had been screaming EDG too much and they were playing Nami and just taking our bot tower and like minute five every single game. So we thought that was the way to play. And then, we came on stage and obviously it wasn't, but I feel like 2016 TSM had a much higher chance of going far than 2017 TSM. Even if we made it out of groups in 2017, we would have to make drastic changes to do anything in quarters. Did the result of 2016 affect what happened in 2017 at Worlds? Like, did losing in that way mean that, you know, when things start to go badly in 2017, was there kind of a feeling like, ah, oh, shit, this is happening again? Or was there any similarities in that mm-hmm. sense? Not for me personally, but I can't really speak for my teammates. I think we had some similar problems and it was very frustrating to have to deal with the same problems, these underlying, I guess, characteristics that people have and these traits that are so hard to change over time. I guess some of the similarities were just not having great bot matchup knowledge. We ended up having, in 2016, I remember we had two matchups that were terrible that almost lost us the games, I would say. We played Jinnami against Modest Alistar, where he carried. We played... We messed up the draft completely, so we ended up playing Lucian against Uzi's Ezreal in the final game against RNG, and our bot lane got rolled. Not just because of picks, but picks were also a part of it. And then we had the problem between our support and jungle communicating, and that was a problem that we were consciously aware of, and we were working on it the entire 2017, but it just didn't feel like we were able to make good enough progress. Obviously, they weren't, these weren't the only reasons we lost in 2017, but it's, it's so disappointing to see the same problems come up again and again, even though yes. they've been in our mind and it's something we've been working on this whole time. But especially on my end, it feels like people aren't taking them as seriously as they should and they're not pushing themselves to, to really change it. And it makes me question how much responsibility they're taking for our failures. In these two worlds, one connecting factor was that, as I, you've kind of hinted at, actually Doublelift took a lot of the lot of uh, criticism because obviously in 2016, as you say, there was this infamous uh, Mata game on Alistair where you just basically completely owned the bot lane and just like wrecked them every time Doublelift ever went for CS almost it felt like. Then obviously in 2017, people had the meme about him never flashing, etc., and you didn't really have a great tournament, right? I will just put in the context here before I ask you the question. Mm -hmm. When I did an episode of Narrative Wake before this split, because Doublelift is famous for trash talking, and the way he does it is, okay, he does do it properly. He does put a bit of, like, like what I like about his style of trash talking is, on the one hand, it obviously is just for show, you know, it's for fun, we can trash talk, but he always does what I think he should do, which is you put a little grain of truth in there. Like, you take something that is sort of true about someone, and then you exaggerate it for the trash talk, right? So, on our episode, I basically said, well, you know, you're not with 
Bjergsen in TSM anymore. So you've got to give me some trash talk about Bjergsen. And he gave me some that's pretty good, actually. I'll, I'll use it in a minute for a separate question. But as a result, the reason I'm bringing this up is you're not in a team with double lift anymore. I'm sure you're a, a good teammate at the time. Was double lift, did he make, did he have some uncharacteristically bad games at these two worlds? Did he play some part in losing this, these games for you? I mean, the double lift in NA was straight fire. He was like MVP candidate. So what, what was he like at these worlds? Yeah, yeah, of course he played a part in our loss, but so did everyone else. I think just when we played in NA, especially in 2016, our balling was always winning. They were just outplaying people mechanically. Biofrost wasn't the smartest player, but he was really strong in laning and really strong mechanics. And that's something Peter really liked from him. But then you go up against, what is it? It's like, is it? Def, Def and Mako on EDG and our bot lane is just outclassed. So we kind of lost our biggest asset from our bot lane, which was their strong laning. So it was really hard for them to learn how to lose gracefully, how to back off tower and not sit on, like stay on tower and greet for CS and die when the enemy team has tempo or their mid laner has a roam timing or their bot lane is pushing you in and chunking you. So it was... It, it was just hard for Peter and Vincent to go from winning lane and being so used to winning lane to learning how to gracefully lose. And I kind of put that responsibility on Peter because Vincent, he's not outspoken enough. He's not confident enough. He will never tell Peter what to do. He's, I think he sees himself kind of like a little brother figure to Peter and he's afraid to step up and kind of speak his mind. So it was really up, up to Peter to do those things and reel Vincent in. But Obviously, that's a big responsibility to put on him. So that was another problem in our team, for sure. So well, doesn't he, didn't he also have, like, I know from whenever I've talked to him, he's come across this way. He's one of those people where, I always say this, right? If you are a star player and you're somebody who's very, very talented, okay, to some degree, you should be quite skeptical of other people's opinions, you know, because you know, you will know what's best for you. You're the one who trains all day long. You do have a very good yeah. sense of what you can do. But he's someone where... I would put him on that those list of players, whereas an outsider, you look at like what's meta. And okay, if you remember at season six, it was like Jin and Ash and stuff, you know. You look at it and you go, why didn't you play any of these chaps? What the hell? Like, you, you're you not going to play Jin ever, you know? Like, mm. you know, there's really good players playing it, you know, dude. Like, look like Death or whatever. You, you think to yourself, you know, these guys are so good. Surely they could just pick these things up and, it'd, you know, it'd be like another weapon in their arsenal. But they can be very stubborn, you know. They think, no, nah, I'm just going to only play these or, or that's just a trash champion. It's too easy or whatever. Does he have that kind of a weird element to him? Yeah, I mean, he's fairly stubborn about the champions he plays, what he thinks is good. You'll see people playing something and just say, no, it's just it's just horrible. It's just not good. Uh, but I think it's, especially since he was removed from our team, and that was a big problem that we had, I think it's something he's become a lot more aware of. And I've noticed on TL, it seems like he's playing a lot more champions and his, t his champion pool is more wide. But on our team, there was a, definitely a problem with him wanting to choose the champions that he's playing and what he's building and similar to me, I guess in season five where I feel like he doesn't have a lot of respect for players that might be more accomplished than him or might be performing better than him. Like the, the top team in Korea, seeing how Prey or Bang are doing certain things. Uh, I didn't feel like he was very open to those things, but I mean, every player comes with negatives and that's just one of the things that you have to deal with to get the positives of having Peter on your team. So. Is is season six worlds one of those ones where just from the scrims, like all the expectations were justified? Like from the scrims, you could have been in the final or made top four or had some insane run. Did everything seem fine before the official games? We were doing okay. I think I think it was only really against EDG and SKT that we were struggling. So we felt like we could at least go to semis or go pretty far because SKT were kind of reinventing the meta during the tournament figure like he does every freaking world started playing rise and they were playing like Jin Zyra bot lane and these things and, and they were just changing up the game in a way that we didn't have time to really adapt to so I, w I wasn't so confident to say that we would win the whole thing but if there was only really those two teams that we were struggling against and other than that I felt really confident in both myself and my team. I thought we could go far and I was definitely expecting us at the very least to get out of groups. It pretty much never crossed my mind that we wouldn't make it out of groups. So it was a big disappointment at the time. 
Over the years, have you ever had, uh, like, I, I know for a lot of league players, like, the way you do it is, okay, when the split's going on, you just focused on do the best I can in the split. Then if you go to MSI, right, okay, I've got to refocus, go to MSI, I'm not getting time off. Okay, then I play the next split, then Worlds. I know for a lot of the top pros, they don't sort of let themselves think about time off or if they're burned out or anything until the end of the split season. It's like in the off season, that's when you reevaluate and you think like, where am I at in my career, etc. Are you a guy who's ever in any of these off seasons? Have you ever thought like, oh, I'm too burned out or maybe I need to take a split off or I need to... I, maybe I shouldn't go as hard in practice, etc. Have you ever had that happen here? Have you ever had the moment of doubt? Yeah, I've had the moment of doubt, but I don't think I've ever actually considered it. There were after we lost in 2016, uh, Peter and Andy they they took me aside and they they talked to me and Peter said, "Oh, Spring Switch sucks. <laughs> I want to be I want to be a streamer. You know, I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to rest up and then I'm going to come back and." He really wanted me to do it, and Andy said, "You know, if this is what you want to do, then then you can. We'll tank Spring Split, or we'll find the best suitable players that we can." But it didn't cross my mind for a second. It just the fact that we performed so poorly in 2060 Worlds, or at least we didn't perform near any of my expectations. I just couldn't see myself taking taking really any any time off at all. So I also just don't see myself as a creative type or a content creator, streamer kind of person. Is I see myself as much more of a competitor. And if if there's a structure that I can apply myself to, then I feel like I can do really well. But if I have to go into this realm where I have to be entertaining and funny and creative, it's just not who I've been for the for these many years, and and not something I see myself naturally turning into. So I felt like. It wasn't pointless for me to playing Spring Split because I could learn more about myself, learn more about uh, my teammates, and even though it's only a few circuit points, I felt like that each split I, I learned a lot of fundamental things about my teammates or myself that can help me become a better player in the future. So it was never on my mind to take a, an off split like Peter did. And to be honest, I was really upset with him when he did because I felt like I had known this driven, driven double lift who really cares about winning, and all of a sudden he wants to settle down with his girlfriend and stream full time instead of instead of playing after after what happened at Worlds. After he walked into Victor and got one shot and, and threw the game for us, it's like I was really surprised that uh, he decided to take that path. But you know, to each their own. But it was just it, it it was not something I was happy with at the time, for sure. Was it always? Uh, in your mind that he was definitely going to come back to the starting lineup and, you know, he'd play for TSM again. Because at the time, like I know, I remember when he, he was lent to Team Liquid at the end of that first split, Reginald actually basically called me and told me this story. And he basically said, like, the reason why, you know, I want to do the interview about this is because, you know, Double F isn't going to really leave. And if, you know, we're just, it is just, we are really just lending him, you know. But he actually did tell me at the time but that doesn't mean he's definitely going to start if he comes back in the summer, though. I'm going to make like him and Wild Turtle compete. And if Wild Turtle really does better than him, then I'll start Wild Turtle instead and he can be the starter. Was that your... Did you have a similar mindset? Like if Wild Turtle does better than you, Peter, then he's just the starting Eddie Carey and maybe you're not, you're not on TSM. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no such thing as sitting in the gaming room and looking around and looking at Turtle and thinking, oh, you're just a placeholder that's going to be here until Peter comes. You know, I wanted Turtle to succeed and I wasn't just sitting around waiting for Peter because I, I wanted someone who was committed and like I said, I was disappointed. I didn't feel like he was very committed so I didn't, I didn't feel like he should just have the luxury of going out and making a lot of money and then returning to the team. So we were... Obviously, playing with Turtle, we were looking at many other AD carry options, but none of them really worked out, and we didn't feel like we found someone who was better than Turtle. But if we did, we would have taken that player, and if we proved himself, we would have kept him, and Peter would have to fight for a spot as a sub. Because no matter how good of a friend they are to me, if someone decides he's just going to take six months off and he thinks he can just re-enter the team... That's just that's just not okay with me because I think everyone has to earn their spot. Even I have to earn my spot on this team. If someone comes around, they're better than me. I don't expect TSM to keep me. 
when you uh, won this split, and obviously it is within these circumstances that you uh, you went with a different lineup from the one that was so dominant before. You got Wild Turtle in. It was a bit closer this time around, and obviously in the final, it was pretty close match overall. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you think back on that that split and the different circumstances? And like, was the was the final as close as it looks on the scoreboard? Uh, yeah, I thought C9 and us were a really close team at the time. Uh, we had some problems with Turtle not being as assertive as Peter. And like I said earlier, Vincent didn't really have his own voice and he wasn't really willing to speak up. So when the, I remember around playoffs, we were just drilling the, just a very basic concept of getting a lead through bottom. Or once we had a lead through bottom, how does bottom actually have an impact on the game? How did they carry the game? How did they get objectives? And it was something I, I and Parth had to sit down and have a lot of talks with them because they couldn't execute on this very basic strategy. So it, we kind of had to unfortunately regress in, in that sense and work on on issues that were already fixed with our previous roster. Not that Turtle is is a bad player in any way, but he had been working with supports where I guess they would share a lot of the responsibilities, but in our team, Vincent was just a mechanical player. He wasn't adding very much to the team and he was having a hard time speaking up. So Turtle wasn't really prepared to come in and just take all these responsibilities and kind of have to communicate for the both of them in Balin, which is something that I guess Peter was was more inclined to because we had that talk way back about how it's, it's really on us for this to succeed and we will take all the responsibility that we can. But it's not something Turtle was really ready for. So we had a lot of problems playing through bot lane in that split. It wasn't our only problem, but I remember it was a it was a very basic thing that we had to continue to drill it, and it kind of set back some of our it set back learning learning other things because if we can't execute on this basic strategy, we can't if we can't win this split, we can't do well on MSI. For obvious reasons, during his entire time in the NALCS, Jensen has been compared to you. I mean, for a start off, Cloud9 and TSM obviously rival teams. Obviously, even replacing a famous shot-calling mid laner with Danish mid laner, it's like the same storyline, you know. And then, since your team was the one winning, people are naturally see it as like Cloud9 has to overtake TSM, Jensen has to overtake Bjergsen. Now, interestingly, at this point in time, because TSM was the better team, a lot of people, a lot of fans, even though the narrative had begun, like maybe Jensen is better than Bjergsen. Oh, in the regular season, maybe he's the MVP. A lot of fans still stick by the logic that like, unless Cloud9 wins the LCS, Bjergsen must have been better. Just looking from your own perspective, what's fair? Uh, do you think you were actually better than, Bjergsen, uh, than Jensen at this point in time? It wasn't just that your team was better. Were you actually a better midliner than at this time? Or in some, you could play for your team in some way that was better. What, what, how would you frame it? Because presumably, it I mean, you're a confident guy. I assume you think you're as good, right? Or, or better. It, depend, it depends how you categorize a, a good player. I felt like there were certain times where Jensen was a better mechanical player than me. But this was also during the time where I put a lot of emphasis on helping my teammates. I was learning to become a better leader. I felt like I was... I felt like a lot of the team success... Uh, or at least some of the team's success was contributed to me being a big part of that and being a big part in helping facilitate my teammates grow and let them become better players. And I have no way of knowing if Jensen has any kind of effect like that. So I think there were there were times where he was a stronger mechanical player than me, and there were times where I was better. But I I knew that the big voice in their team was was really. Uh, smoothie and smoothie was controlling a lot of the macro and a lot of the team's decisions. Whereas in my, in my team, I was the one who was, you know, like I said, facilitating my teammates' growth. I was a shot caller. I was making sure everyone was doing the right thing. And yeah, I mean, I, I felt like I was adding more to my team than, than Jensen was, but of course I have no real way of knowing that. So do you, do you think of him as a, a personal rival? Do you care about any of that sort of stuff? There was a time where I saw him as a personal rival, but I, th- I think I'm just I'm happy that he's there to push me. Or I think now he doesn't stand out as much compared to the other mid laners as he did back then in 2017. But in 2017, he was really a player that was pushing me to grow and become a, a better mechanical player, have better 
understanding of my my champion's limits, my laning phase, and and things like that. So, I mean, if if I if Jensen wasn't my opponent, I think I would have been a, a weaker individual player in 2017 because he was he was the guy pushing me to improve at all times. So it's like he's he's my rival, but in a way, I'm grateful for that because I wouldn't be as good if I hadn't been practicing against him all the time. Okay. Right. When people um, remember the summer split this time around, it was the one where in the finals he played Immortals, and this in its own way was a close final, and was a classic sort of feel-good win on the fourth game, the way he came back in it. What do mm-hmm. you think of for this title? Like, does this one, since each title has its own sort of storyline and atmosphere and build-up and stuff, what would the storyline for, for this championship be? I think for the split as a whole, it was our minds were focused towards the international tournaments, and I was trying to make a really big point of rather than putting bandages on issues, actually fixing these deep rooted issues, and not just, for example, playing our comfort champions to win, like be willing to play different compositions that might come up internationally because these international teams are going to be able to play a wide variety of styles. So I think throughout the split. It even became this huge meme that, oh, TSM is practicing for Worlds, but that was really what we did to some degree because we really disappointed ourselves in 2016 and even at MSI, and I could I could tell that some of the reasons why we lost were some of the same issues. So 2016, 2017, summer, uh, a big part of that was trying to get to the bottom of some of these things and fixing them so we can succeed internationally and not just in NA. Which is why sometimes we looked a bit shaky because we were it was best of three, there was more leeway and we weren't always playing what we were the most comfortable with, but also playing things that we we knew we would have to learn in order to be one of the best teams in the world. So as I referenced, if you add up the two worlds, yes, double lift got criticism in both. But 2017 Worlds is actually the first time I can personally remember people like legitimately criticizing you. Like here's the difference. When they criticized you before, it was usually like weird intangible things like, oh, in the reality series, he seemed like a bit arrogant or like he was arguing to, you know, like not, you can't really put any stock in that. Like that's just someone te- someone's perspective on something they've seen. But 2017 was the first time I actually saw people like, no, in the game, Bjergsen fucked up in this way or he cost them a match here or famous I mean, what they said about you at this Worlds was, you know, you weren't aggressive enough in this team fight or you should have you should have picked something and carried the game. Whatever the criticism was, it seemed like this had a fairly loud voice at the time. People were, were kind of singling you out as one of the main people they blamed. How did you react to this? Because it did seem like un- normally you're very good at like you don't give off much online and you- I've never really seen you go on, on Twitter and like just tweet something if you're mad or whatever. But something rattled you a bit about this, right? Yeah, uh, I I mean, I, I felt like I was at a, playing at a pretty good level, but I felt like just the way we were playing as a team, the way we were communicating and making plans, just a lot of those res- responsibilities fell on me. And in my opinion, I think that my teammates made some pretty crucial mistakes that made me look a lot worse as a player because... When I had opportunities to roam and I would move on the map, their players would back off, but my teammates would often die to plays that were obvious and that I was calling. So it hurt my ego quite a bit to see people uh, attacking me and being so hard on me. But I think I just I came to understand eventually that people are going to have they have higher expectations of me than they have of anyone else on my team. So even though they might not feel like I was the worst performing player on the team, they felt like I wasn't performing to the high standards that they've set for me and that I should have those high standards for myself and that I should just learn to to take responsibility for for my own shortcomings and even for my team's shortcomings because if I'm the leader of the team, I should be able to influence my teammates in ways that they're not making these mistakes. Not saying I played perfect by any means. I just don't think I played as badly as... I mean, obviously, like you said, people people over-exaggerate to, to make a point. But... This was a good learning lesson for me to not just take responsibility for myself, but also take responsibility for for my teammates not learning certain things or not listening to me or or things like that. 
when because I, th- I think a lot sorry, of yeah. I think I think a, lo- a lot of the accusations that people made are easily disputable or a lot of the a lot of the plays like he didn't flash ulti someone here or when he roamed bot against misfits he didn't uh, flash Cassio ult but some of those I mean I can pull it up to this day but they're just not analyzed by someone who has good enough game knowledge to actually understand that it's not a good play but I didn't want to I guess put myself out there and look defensive and try to defend myself over these few plays because I didn't have the best tournament of my life and I didn't play perfect but it was frustrating me that people were, you know, you know, just saying things that obviously weren't true because they didn't have the same level of game knowledge that me or or my teammates would have. So it's frustrating seeing, I guess, someone saying things that are that are untrue to to paint a picture in their, um, in their in their storyline or their narrative. But when yeah. when you referred earlier to <coughs> some of the. Let's say minor personality clashes with double lift, or times when you know his ex- he didn't maybe meet your expectations, or you thought like you know, oh, come on, dude, you're a leader as well, or one of the star players. Like, what are you doing, taking a split off after season after um, season seven worlds, where obviously it's the exact same lineup that was at the previous worlds, and we've kind of got this pattern set now, which is that in the splits when this lineup plays, it's fucking amazing, it's dominant ENA, but at the two mm-hmm. international tournaments, it's failed. Right, even if on paper you look at all the names and you're like, how can we cut any of these players? They're all good players, you know, they're all very good. Oftentimes when something like that happens, that you fail a bunch of times, you sometimes just need a drastic change, right? Like even if on paper the guy's a good player, sometimes you need to just change things up. Something's just not working. Was was there a was it always in your mind uh, a case that like the Bjergs and Doublelift partnership had to split up at this point in time? Hmm. Had it kind of run its course? Or could you have could you be together right now and it'd be season eight and we'd be it'd still be double F Bjergsen in a similar team? I, I definitely didn't come into the off season just expecting for him to to get kicked, but I I did want to get suitable subs for every position in the team if possible. I mean, Riot ended up making this whole Academy team thing, which I didn't know of at the time, but I wanted there to be pressure on people if they're not fixing these long-term issues, or if if I don't if we don't feel like they're driven enough, or they're not applying themselves well enough, and and that applies to me too. If I'm not pushing myself, I sh- I should have a suitable replacement ready. But it it end up, of course, if we're going to pick up these other good players, a, a lot of our current players doesn't want to stay as subs or fighting for a spot. Like for example. We gave Dennis the opportunity to share the spot with Mike and share time and and practice. But if you have a main, if you have the opportunity to take a main spot with C9, of course he's going to take that over sharing and fighting for his spot on our team. So I think that's completely understandable. But yeah, I, I guess Double If and I had another kind of clash in expectations after this Worlds because he had a meeting with Parth where he just pretty much said that he felt like we should keep the same roster, maybe pick up some extra players but he didn't really feel like we did many things wrong and he felt like we did good in practice and we just weren't able to perform on stage and personally I was hurt by that and I felt like that wasn't a good mentality because of course we didn't do things right we didn't make it out of freaking groups it's not just about our it's not just about how we played on stage it's about how we practice how we weren't able to solve some of these issues um, maybe that people were people were tilting or you know, there's there's so many problems. So hearing that from him was was personally personally pretty disappointing. I mean, I, I might be saying some negative things about Peter, but he's he's this person that has a lot of positives, and then he has some negatives. He's not he's not quiet, or he's not a person that's not going to speak his mind. So he he's straight up and honest, and I appreciate that about him. So that means that there's very clear good things, and then and then some things that I don't agree with as much. Is, sure, I just don't, I, don't, I don't want people to take it the wrong no. way. That, oh my God, I'm bringing all this shit about Peter. But no, I mean, it's it's just, in, first of all, it's in the context of if you noticed in the interview, you win all the splits you played with him, so we know domestically it was all great. But this is in the context of trying to be something more than maybe the West's ever seen. Go super far at worlds, and so you have to hold people to the highest expectations, right? Yeah, I mean, even at 2016, Peter was carrying a bigger load than I was in the in the team. He was. He was more of a leader than I, I was. In 2017, I think I stepped into the role more, but in 2016, he 
was the more assertive and, and confident guy and he was good at leading people and a big voice and I knew that the other players they looked up to Peter as as a, the leader in the team and he took a lot of responsibilities so even though he, he might have made a big mistake against uh, against Samsung we wouldn't even have been in that position in the game if it wasn't for his play and leadership in that game because I had a horrible game and Peter was the reason we even made it as far as we did so as I as I referenced earlier when I was asking about the breakup of this uh, duo, this very successful lineup, when something like this happens, it's the same for Reginald. Like if I'm looking at this lineup again, I'm going, well, I mean, the lineup's amazing in NA and it is good players, but, you know, something's got to change. I've got to do something to try and make it a different team going forward. It's had two chances at Worlds, right? Bizarrely, because this was the first time I ever saw you get the real, like, I think people genuinely were disappointed and suddenly a lot of people did turn and they were like, right, he just chokes in every international tournament and he's fucked up. You know, People actually, for the first time ever, really were asking, maybe Bjergsen shouldn't be on TSM anymore. And if you think about it, any moment in history before that, that would be a ridiculous suggestion. Like obviously, when you first joined the team, you were one of the best things about the team. Then there was a period in the middle where the team was starting to fall around apart you, but you were still one of the best aspects. You know, you've won all these championships in NA. Do you think that Reginald ever actually seriously considered a world without Bjergsen on TSM? Did you think he ever, in his mind, in the off-season or whatever, thought about like potential other rosters, lines, anything like that? Have you ever yourself thought about, maybe I might want to play for another team or listen to offers? Has it ever happened? Uh, I thought about potentially playing on another team, but <clears throat> in every off-season where I've talked to Andy, he's he's willing to go the extra mile and do everything he can to get the best players obviously this change that he made this year we kicked a lot of players that the fans really liked it was a it obviously hurt the brand of the team to make all these changes but he wants for the team to perform as well as possible so i i can't really i haven't i've entertained the thought of playing for a different team but as soon as i talk to andy it, it goes away because i feel like we have very similar values and we care about Sure, you can be with TSM always sucks at Worlds, but really, me and him put uh, results and comp competition over branding and, and media like some of these other teams do. So I've always felt like Andy's willing to do whatever he feels is necessary and whatever I feel is necessary for the team to succeed. And to your earlier point about making changes because we failed two years in a row, that was... Part of the reason why I was disappointed in Peter feeling like we he couldn't think of something that we needed to change, but we just played bad on stage because I felt like we had to make changes and and we needed to figure out what those changes need to be because you don't just fail two times in a row and then and then think, oh, you know what we've been doing is fine. We just need to do better on the day. That that just wasn't acceptable in my head because I, I think. Part of the reason why we also made these changes is just I think no one on our team, if we played a third year together and we went to Worlds and we failed again, it, it would just be a joke, you know? I mean, it, if we, if we, it's like uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, right? And that's yes. what it would be. We would just be doing the same thing again and again and hoping for a different outcome, but I don't think that's realistic. Right, as I referred to earlier, when Doublelift gave me this trash talk about Bjergsen, which was, it, listen, it was, as you'd expect, it was very entertaining, but it had a, it maybe had a seed of truth. I wanted to get your take on this because it kind of is like uh, a more informed version of what a lot of people criticized you for. So obviously the, the narrative around Bjergsen around this point in time and the failure of Worlds was like, oh, he just played too safe and he never roamed. And basically what Doublelift said was, he said that that was a flaw that he thought you had as a mid laner, which is that if things started to go badly for you in mid lane, you were kind of like overly defensive or in your mind, you were sort of like, right, well, if I do anything more than the the minimum, I'm going to lose the game. So, so he gave the exaggerated example of the fact that like in one game, you, you know, you were getting pushed in and then you told the rest of the team like, oh, by the way, uh, the other mid can just roam on every 
wave and you and then the, the joke is like double up was like every wave and you were like yeah every wave and then it makes it sound like you know as if you just get behind in cs you're like right i'm under my time like it makes you sound like the most re- like like fucking kowtowed actually funnily enough people know like that's probably too in, de- in in depth for me actually people won't know the reference but it makes you sound like a, an incredibly defensive player or that you had a certain mindset at this point in time that isn't like the guy people remember a couple of seasons earlier hard carrying games and you know smashing the other enemy mid laner was there was any was there any truth to any of this? I, I think to some degree he was playing to what people were saying and the narrative because I actually I actually watched the clip and he's he's laughing as he says it. Sure. And I think people take it more serious than perhaps they should. But I think maybe there were times where I I, I tried to be too stable of a player because I I often felt like. In 2017, I was in charge of a lot of the macro, and since we weren't able to get a a really good communication system, it kind of fell on to just it's either me or Peter doing it. And I, I felt like there were there were times in the game where I focused more on being a stable player so that I could lead my team through communication and shot calling. Because if I was to fall too far behind, it would be hard for me to look outside my my own role and kind of understand the whole map and or understand the whole perspective of the map but I don't necessarily think I was a passive player honestly I don't I never agreed to that uh, narrative and I don't personally think it's true but I'm willing for someone to to show me and change my mind I do I do think there's times where I said that the enemy mid laner can can roam every way but I think that if there are certain scenarios in the game where that is the truth and that's how the game is played out. If you're too far behind and your jawler is weak and the other lanes are going 50-50, you, you can't break the cycle of him continuously pushing the wave first and moving into a pink warded river. And at that point, you either have to give up a tower or base and kind of try to reset the tempo. It's just, I think that's just how the game works. I mean, it's it goes the same for bot lane, but I think the way the way... People who understood it is a, a lot more extreme than I think Peter meant. When That's you at least descri- my take on it. When you describe like some of these reasons that people wouldn't see uh, inside the server as to why you did something, or sometimes, for example, you, as you say here, maybe you were just trying to play more of a stable game and not give up an advantage, and maybe you thought, okay, if I just play stable, it gives my teammates a chance to carry the game, or later on we're going to be able to come back in this match. Right, This sort of mentality... I, I can't criticize entirely because, for example, obviously one of my favorite players, Froggard, is actually quite famous for this, which is like in a lot of games, in the days when people could play assassins and just go super harm and try and carry the game individually, he famously actually did this a lot, where what he would do is, he's someone where if you ever talk to him, it's not that he doesn't think he ever did anything wrong and he could ever lose the game. It's more like he always has a, a logical reason as to why he did something. So, for example, if it looks like at a point in game he's not doing much, it's because he's thinking like, right, well, at this point, I just need to sort of stay stay stable. And then in 10 minutes, we're going to have a chance where there'll be a spike in the comp or, you know, something mm-hmm. will happen that we could win later. And so that's one thing I did always respect was the notion that he... In a way, it wasn't just individually. He's trying to think how can the, how can we actually win this match till at all points in the game. And sometimes that doesn't mean right now you have to do something. Yeah, I don't personally think I was close minded. No one ever in my team or my coaching staff. No one ever brought up, oh, you're you're playing too passive. You're not playing in the correct way when you're behind, or you're not using these opportunities. No one ever told me that, and I've never. I've never taken it on myself to think like, oh yeah, I'm actually a, a really passive player. Instead, I just I watched the games, and obviously there were diff- there were times where I could have made better decisions when behind or went ahead. But I try to just take what I can learn from those tournaments and hope to prove people wrong in the future and prove that I'm not that person that they might have seen or that they might have uh, misunderstood or, or that thing that there is some truth to. But even though maybe I, I didn't make the best decisions in some cases, I never felt like I was just a passive player or I was sure. a player that didn't take any risks. And more so, it motivated me to prove those people wrong. Well, and hopefully also, I can still. 
I mean, as anyone knows who's heard any of my content about Frogger, there's also a big difference between passive if you're applying it in terms of like decision making. Like it's one thing to be passive and be like, oh, I'm scared to make a decision. There's also a style of play, which I, I, I made a video once where I described it as you have to separate out passive in terms of like mental approach and defensive in a particular game. Like obviously as a mid laner, there are going to be games where with this particular pick and this the way the game's going, yeah, I'm not going to try and make mad 1v1 outplays all day long and just flash another guy's tower and try and kill him, you know? Maybe I'm playing a control mage that just farms up and I, you know, my chance to carry the games in 20 minutes. Are yeah. you someone where, in general, are you more risk-averse, though, individually? Like, will you go for all-out moves? Will you do risky things if you think, oh, can win you the game in this moment? Hmm. I mean, I don't think there's such a thing as saying I'll always do that or I'll never do that. I'll sure. I'll do it when I when I feel like it's right and when I feel like it's my opportunity to to do things. Uh, I think in the in the last year or two, I've been a lot more willing to make mistakes or make calls that I don't know if are right or not, and then learning from the experience rather than being too hesitant to to do those things. So, but I, I see myself as someone who, if it comes down to it, I'm willing to go in and, and make the play and make that mistake. Like in the game we played against 100 Thieves, uh, this split, Mithy and I had the, the famous suicide where he time can all these into the enemy team and I take it and we just completely, <laughs> it looks like we're just intentionally feeding in the enemy team. But I didn't know how that play was going to turn out. I'm not worried about my kitty. I'm not trying to save my kitty. Mithy said, all right, let's go take my Tomalt. And I put my full trust in him and I did it. If if I was worried about my KDA or my reputation, I, I wouldn't be doing those things. So I don't personally see myself as a, you know, like KDA or risk averse player. When I Because that, that was a that was a pretty horrible high risk play. Sure. <laughs> <to be honest. laughs> When I brought up before the rivalry, which for obvious reasons exists between you and Jensen mm -hmm. and people wanting to say who's better, etc. When you were describing before, like what he does for his team and the setup in his team, etc. Okay, so for example, I made a tweet not that long ago when we were recording this interview, where I said on Twitter that like Jensen was better than Bjergsen for two years or whatever. Yeah, and I noticed you like Loki liked it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I gave so a little bit of that one. You'd give me the passive aggressive, like Loki like, right? Which like could yeah. mean anything, obviously. It could mean like this is stupid or whatever. And I here's it was the thing. Entertaining. I it was yeah. entertaining. Listen, by the way, not everything I say on Twitter is is absolutely uh, is reasonable or necessarily what people would agree with. I think people come to expect that. And also this is not reflections for me. I'm not a I'm not a liberty to have to explain myself. But I will say, I'm I'm always fully I, like here's the thing, I never say I'm an unbiased person. I'm actually a very biased person. I just know what my biases are and I'll admit what they are. So for example, I think people know by now I do like players who like sort of are a bit selfish and they just they are like I smash the lane. I'm like individually the best, you know. And at the moment Jensen obviously does like embody that to some degree if you think of a lot of the mid laners that are out there there aren't that many of them kind of left of that breed you know a lot more people do think you should have to play for the team now and admittedly in the current meta maybe you do but mm. i will say obviously i don't know a lot of the intangible things within the teams so when you see something like that right i'm just using this as an example not this specific case and you know yourself that within TSM, for example, you still have to take some leadership roles, some shot calling roles. Whereas, for example, in Cloud9, to my knowledge, they've never actually expected Jensen to be a leader. He really is just his job is you are the mid laner, play mid lane really well, do do things like this, pick for yourself, do well in the lane, and then you know, as you're saying, there'll be someone like Smoothie, or there'll be someone else in the team who takes care of the leadership components. Does it feel unfair when people can't know the intangible things and they just look in the server and they say? X is better than Y because of this, but they can't know all the story. Does it feel kind of like you should get some more credit? I mean, I think I've had my fair share of credit. I think I can't even say how unfair it is because I don't know how much of an effect uh, that X player has in the team or how much they the other person has in the team. But the way I think of a player to be valuable is you know how easy they are to work with, how well they communicate, how well they take criticism, how hard do they work. It's I feel like you can have like and leadership capabilities and and shot calling and good game knowledge because I feel like if you have five players that have incredible mechanics but they don't contribute anything to their team or anyone around them that team is bound to fail. You need at least one type like like Smoothie or Mada or or these kinds of players. So 
it just depends. I think the fans and the media obviously values individual skill a lot because it's it's what shows, it's what's flashy, it's what looks cool, it's what it's what makes the hype moments. But really, those players would never be in a position to make those kinds of plays if it wasn't for the person or the people within the team that puts them in that position through the way they work in the team every day and the value that they add and and the macro shock line that they do. So that's, I guess, how I see a player being valuable. So I can't really judge when other people have completely different value structures or what they think makes a player good. Because I don't, I don't judge think it, individual but, skill is everything. But in your own mind, this has to play a factor. Right? Like a part of you has to think, well, you know, don't just judge me on, on the individual laning, for example. You know, I'm doing these other things as well. Um, yeah, of course. But I think that if you're good enough at that and you're good enough at being a leader and you're good enough at doing macro, then your team will, will win and that'll give you the spotlight that you need right. and you'll be able to outshine them. I think this last split, people talked about how I played so, oh, so badly in the beginning and I wasn't having any effect on any of the games. And then towards the end of the split, I'm all of a sudden MVP candidate and all this bull crap and oh, I'm playing so much better. But in reality, it was just our team coming together and our, our communication systems being a lot better, making better macro decisions that put me in position to make better plays and, and having set strategies as a team. I don't think I made some a miraculous improvement from the beginning of the split to the end. It's just we became a better team and that made me shine so much more. So, Obviously, another narrative that came out of Worlds and is something that has been present mm -hmm. during the time you've been in TSM was the notion that TSM doesn't have junglers or they don't know how to use junglers or play around junglers. And then that obviously, because you're the one player that's still in the team from season four, people say Bjergsen doesn't know how to play with a jungler. Or, or, I mean, at times the most extreme version is people would say stuff like, you know, Bjergsen just makes his jungler play a certain way. What would you, obviously we're talking about a lot of different junglers here. Is there some grain of truth to it? Has TSM had its own different philosophy playing around junglers what about you individually what would you say to the overall topic me individually i don't i think there's no truth to it to be honest i think i've had good relationships with most of my junglers or especially dennis and i feel like on the contrast of limiting him i feel like i've i really try my hardest to enable him to speak his mind and say what he wants and be more of a selfish player because at his i guess the the base roots of his personality. He's a player that wants to give, and if people are asking for resources, he's very willing to give up his jungle camps to go gank a lane or give up his jungle camps to go get wards. And me and the rest of the team really tried to help him just be more decisive and be able to make these calls and be more selfish as a jungler and be willing to say, all right, guys, now you're just going to have to be on your own for a minute. I'm going to farm all my camps, and then I'll be on the map, and I'll see what I can do. So... It feels just really strange reading these comments when the whole year I've been trying to do the opposite. I've been trying to facilitate him to make his own decisions and be a bigger voice in the team. <laughs> the narrative is that I'm doing, I'm limiting my journalists in some way. So, but it's just something that people can't know. They they can't know how the how the team how the team works on the inside and how the players interact. So I I can't really blame them. They. They see that maybe Centaurin was not performing well and Dennis not performing well. I mean, I don't think Amazing was playing so badly. I think, I think I think he was playing to the level that people expected. But then uh, they see that I'm the common denominator and put the blame on me. But I don't I don't think there's truth to it personally. Do you think that be, like it does being the jungler for TSM? come with more pressure? Do you think that affects people who, who become the junglers? Because they do seem to sort of, if not to do with you, they do seem to become a bit more kind of like shot, like passive actually than they are when they're in other teams. Yeah, I think there's truth to the pressure from the fan base. The, the fan base, we have a lot more fans, which means that we also have a lot more negative feedback when you don't do well or you have a bad game. And even that was something that Mike was aware of and it was almost affecting him before it even happened. So me, Song and everyone kind of had to work with him getting over his nerves and, you know, telling him that we believe in him. And even if he has a bad game, it's it's just another another game for him to grow and become. I guess we just tried to show him how much we trusted him and that he shouldn't 
take what these people are saying on on Reddit for for what he thinks that what he thinks that we might feel. Like he he might feel that we have the same feelings as people are saying on Reddit. So I was just constantly reaffirming him that you know I trust him and I want him to to grow and and do his best. So I th- I think there's the pressure from the community. I think also when Andy steps in, he is really hard on people and and. He's very blunt with people, similar to how Peter is. And personalities like Dennis and Centaurin are not as argumentative. Uh, they're, they're nice guys. They don't want to step on people's toes. So they might have a, a bit of a harder time dealing with Andy's blunt criticism. It takes time to learn to take that kind of criticism because he is very forward and he'll say what he feels. But with time, I feel like people, they learn to understand that he just gives feedback in a different way way than other people and it's something that uh, you kind of have to learn to take in that way but I think it can initially put a lot of pressure on on those players especially the ones that are a bit more quiet. Amazing was not and he spoke up to Andy a lot and they had a lot of discussions and afterwards Amazing said that Andy was one of the people that he was most grateful for because he learned uh, so much from him and Andy was willing to even though they were both sometimes yelling and screaming at each other, they were willing to talk it out and, and reach a consensus. So I think that definitely the pressure of the fans, somewhat pressure of, of Andy and how strong his character is, and also just how high pressure the TSM environment is as a whole. And I guess you could put some of the blame for me on that because I've had a lot of times where my team is not very serious or I don't feel like anyone is pushing themselves and I can tell that we're regressing and we're losing habits and we're we're digressing in we'll we'll learn a certain thing and we'll focus on it and then we'll move on to the next thing and I see the the old skill that we've already learned and almost mastered is going away because people are losing focus or getting complacent when we're winning so I do put a decent amount of pressure on on all of my teammates to you know, take it serious to be a professional player and show up and do your best in practice and make sure you get enough sleep and you're staying, you know, mentally sane and just actually putting in effort and in, in practice and not just messing around or is here for the fun. So maybe that limits my teammates in ways I don't know, but I also think it brings them up in other ways. And I think it's also part of why we've been so successful is that we are very uh TSM environment is very driven and we, or I try to push other players in the team to be a better version of themselves. When I was describing the off season at the end of season five, where you got Yellow Star and Double Lift and this team put together, and I said that at the time on paper this all looked like perfect, all the right moves, you know, they could, this could never go badly. And in the end, it didn't go that badly. Obviously, you still finished second. You were close to winning. The same thing, pretty much happened in this off season now i'll take aside the mike young because obviously that is a gamble you know this isn't a player that's like super established but yeah. when i heard that they're getting the g2 bot lane so this isn't even like putting double lift and yellow star that on paper looked like wow there's a really great players you know because actually when you describe it when you look back those reasons do make sense as to why it didn't work as much like if, if yellow star comes in but he's sort of like yeah, I'm not necessarily going to be the main shot caller. And then you add in that, you know, he was never the most lane dominant spot. You can already start to sort of rationally think, well, yeah, maybe this isn't yeah. going to be as great as it looks on paper. But on paper, bringing in the G2 bot lane of Sven and Mithy sounds perfect. I mean, they've got all this experience playing together, experience internationally and domestically. Then you add in Mithy is someone else who has this reputation as like so smart about the game. People think he's like the EU matter now. You know, it knows about the game. I mean, people have even gone so far in Europe as to imply that like he was sort of like his own coach in all these Mm. championships they've won, you know. People will take narratives very far. Of course. How How does this lineup not, get to the final, blow everyone out the water. What, what Can you give us some of the reasons? Admittedly, I will say as a caveat, this is reflection. So usually you get to talk about things that are years old and you've thought about a lot. This is very fresh. So I'm not necessarily expecting that you have everything nailed down, but just give us a sense of like, what were the expectations when you got the, these two players? And what do you think the disconnect has been or what's been different about the past seasons that were so successful? Um, I think the big, a big part of why we weren't meshing as well as first is just, I played with pretty much the same roster for about two years and it was pretty much the same with Sven and Mithy. So they had <clears throat> their roles within the team or the things that they needed to communicate and the way that they were in that team, I guess. And 
you have to really revamp that whole structure. But it's it's like, for example, if you've practiced a strategy enough or a certain part of the map enough, it reaches a point where you don't you barely have to communicate. But then when you join a new team, you have to really bring up all the basics again and make sure that everyone has the same fundamental knowledge of the game. And there were just things that that they were used to and I was used to that we had to realign. And I think especially the way they, they played with Mike, we had uh, some problems with bot lane and Mike synergizing because they were used to Trick, who was a very confident jungler. He knows what he wants. He he will just... Sven says there's some meme where Trick says, all right, guys, good luck for one minute. I'm going to be farming and <laughs> I hope you survive. I'll be on the map in one minute. But Mike, again, has this mentality similar to Svensker where I think he comes in as a rookie. He wants to he wants to please us and he wants to, if we ask for a gank, he'll immediately go for the gank rather than be more selfish. And it's kind of been the same story where we're pushing Mike to be more selfish and we're pushing him to make his own decisions and not blindly listen to us. We make suggestions for players all the time because that's what you're supposed to do in a team. You're supposed to put the options out there. And Mike was too willing to sacrifice himself. and So they weren't used to a jungler that wasn't as confident in, in himself and as much of a leader. And so I, I think a big part of us kind of learning to to take yourself from the way that you function in your old team and the role you had in your own team to building our own communication systems and figuring out how we were going to do review, what things we were going to communicate, what was going to be our communication structure and things like that. Once we really had a meeting uh, about that and about how, we, how we're going to take all these uh, good parts and actually implement them into being a good team because we had a big problem of in post game review, we always knew what to do. We would look at the replay and say, Oh, we should be doing this. But we had a hard time getting everyone on the same page and having everyone understand the same thing within the game. So it was just about what things we need to be communicating for everyone to understand those things. Because in G2, they have to say a certain thing for everyone to understand the plan. And my team was different. And once we did that, we started looking like a strong team and we started doing really well and people started seeing it, us as a contender. And unfortunately, I think we just had a really bad series. I don't think our preparation was that bad. I think on the day, we just didn't perform like the team that I knew we were, which was really disappointing. It kind of reminded me of uh, 2017 Worlds where I just feel people tilting and losing confidence in, in themselves during the series and I really wanted to to help them, help people untilt or help people uh, get out of that bad mindset. But it's still a skill that I haven't really developed to be able to influence my teammates in that way. So it's something I'm working on for next split. As I said earlier, when we were criticizing double lift or pointing out his flaws as a teammate, as a player, that's because in the context of TSM, it's expected to win and LCS is expected to go to Worlds. So then the the question now becomes, can you go deep at Worlds? This is, you know, these are, you have to put expectations according to people's ability level. So for a lot of players, winning an, L, an LCS championship is a big deal, you know? I mean, there's some players, I mean, funnily enough, if you think of people like Jankos, Forgiven, they've never been in an LCS final. They've never won an LCS championship. For them, that would still be a big career goal. It's still kind of like their narrative. That's the end of their narrative at the moment. You know, they haven't gotten to the end of that path. You've done this many times. What does it actually mean to Bjergsen to win LCS titles? Uh, I think it, it still means a decent amount. It doesn't feel nearly as good winning it now as it did the first time, but it means that... I, I, I've still got it. I'm not washed up. I still have what it takes to be a professional player. And I think that each year I have more and more responsibilities a, as a player within the team. And I feel more and more responsibility for the team's performance. And I think it, it, it's a big change from when in the beginning I only cared about myself and I didn't help my teammates. And if they were not performing, I would just hope eventually that I would get better teammates. But now I really try to take responsibility for everything that I can. And if my teammates aren't improving in a certain way, then I see that as me not helping them or not facilitating them or putting them in an environment where they can change or not bringing up the issue well enough or in a good enough manner. Because I think there's no point in sitting around and 
and then blaming your teammates for anything. It's a team game, so you just have to do everything that's within your sphere of control to make your team perform. And I wasn't able to do that this split. Is winning an obsession for you? Mm. I mean, it depends how you define obsession. I, I don't see myself doing anything else than winning. And this is my this is my life. Obviously, I take it very serious because this is what I commit all my time to. It's what I commit my scrim time to. Afterwards, solo queue, pretty much my entire life, I try to be a better teammate, um, more more stable person so that I can be someone my teammates can rely on. And I don't want to commit these important years in my life and all my time during these years. I don't see my family. I, I barely have friends. I don't do a lot outside of of league. I don't want that to... I, I don't want to just be an average player or be a player that loses in quarterfinals. If I'm going to commit my entire life to this, then I have to be the best. That's how I've always felt. I use someone where... Right. One of the things I found very interesting, I've noticed that European players seem to have a different mentality on this because so many of the NA players who were big names already did streaming on the side or some of them even thought to themselves that, you know, the moment I'm sick of playing, I'll just become a streamer. A lot of them actually had a whole bunch of times in their careers where they were like, oh, maybe I'll just retire this split. No, I'll play one more split, you know. But I've noticed a lot of the EU players that I know, like I remember when I talked to Nuke Duck, this is a couple of years ago as well. I was kind of asking him sort of like, so is this kind of, you know, the last go around? Like it's this team. And he was like, no, nah, I'll play for like five more years if I, you know, if there's a team that wants me and I'm good, you know. Like, And I know the same with Froggen. Like I think he just, just every season he just thinks, right, what team am I going to be on now? I'm going to play again. Are you someone where... There's no limit to to how long you could play if everything was if the circumstances were right. Do you see, like like if if League of Legends really lasted ten more years and it was at the same level, and you you were still a good player, you would just play ten more years. Could you do it? It's hard to tell because I don't know how much I'll change. I've changed so much in the last four years since I joined TSM. I don't know how much I'll change in the next four years, but I think as long as I feel like I can be the best or can be one of the best in the world, I'll continue playing. But I don't want my legacy to end with me being a washed up delusional player that doesn't that doesn't understand how good he is. So I want to be realistic with myself, but as long as I feel like I can be one of the best, I feel like I'll keep going. And I still think I'm one of the best. With all the LCS trophies you have and all the times you've been in the finals and all this success was it shocking to go out in the quarterfinals yeah of course of course it was shocking it was really disappointing but it just uh, means that I have things that I'm not doing well enough yet if I can't even make it through quarters I think Clutch is a respectable team but I don't think it's a team that that we should be losing to. Uh, if we want to accomplish anything anywhere, losing a best of five to clutch is just not acceptable. When people, it was actually back in like, I think it was even in season season four maybe when people first started that famous thing. <laughs> Funnily enough, it was actually Inven who did it of like Bjergsen is the faker of NA. Now people have gone way too far criticizing that because I noticed that triggers the fuck out of people because what people always think that means for some bizarre reason it's something about the new generation they think they interpret it literally like Bjergsen is faker whereas actually as an analogy that's a very good analogy like contextually you have both been the players who've won the most in your regions you have always been very good in your regions you have been the dominant player in your regions you know in a lot of ways it does match up. Do you feel if I just talk only about NALCS? Do you do you feel like that that fits you? Like, have you been have have you felt like you've dominated the NALCS and you've been the best player over the last few years? I think I've I don't know about dominated, but I think I've been consistently the best player in the NALCS. Yeah, I do feel that way, but I don't think that even qualifies for any kind of title as NA Faker because Faker is not. He's not good because he's won OGN so many times. I think there's even... They they don't even win the LCK every time. It's not like SKT sure. is consistently winning. They they lost the split as well. I think uh, they lost to Rox, Tigers. They lost to KT, but then KT split. lost to Rox. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. They finished third but, in that one. But what makes Faker great is that he's winning the tournaments when it matters, and I haven't done that yet. So 
I would say within the NA, I've been dominant, but I haven't really earned that name fully yet. Since you have so many of the domestic championships, though, all you really are missing is the world's run. Like, if you had a world's run to semis, or maybe if, like, the bracket was great and you had an epic game and you made the finals, the, for many people, how they judge someone's career, this would be, like, the whole career that's complete. Like, you, they've not, there wouldn't be many criticisms people could place against you then, right? If in, the, if in a couple of years you can do this, you can have a great world's performance, you can add that to all these championships you've got domestically. For you personally, if you retire... Could you, would you think of yourself like, I, w I was the best Western player, just for yourself? Oof. Like, forget what everyone else thinks. Would you yourself <laughs> believe it? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't really think in that fashion. I don't think about whether I'm the best or not. I just think about whether I've satisfied my own expectations. So I think it would more so be along those lines that if I was to win MSI or go to the finals at Worlds or at least have a showing that I felt proud of and that I felt we could be proud of as a team. Not necessarily about how far we got, but that we really did our best and we just were outclassed rather than I feel like we weren't playing as well as I want us to play or I feel like we could play. Then I would feel like I my career would live up to what I would want it to be, I guess. But okay. I don't spend any time thinking about, oh, am I the best in the West or not? Because it's just doesn't it doesn't matter to me it's not important to me it's just important how i feel about myself and my accomplishments right if i ask if double lifts a rival obviously part of the problem with that is because he famously does trash talk a lot of people like you know the queue of people who are his rivals at any point in time is pretty long do you see him as a rival though in light of your history in light of the the times that were good and obviously some of the the split and the way it ended is he a rival to you uh, in some sense, yeah. I, I guess he's he's a friend, but he's one that I really want to beat, of course, because we've had a lot of our share of good and bad times. But I think first and foremost, he's a good friend of mine, and I think he's a friend that I'll have for a long time. He's not just someone that I would play on a team with and then never talk to again, like some other teammates I've had, or I'm sure other professional players will know this, that... There's people that they live with for a year or two, but they never actually formed a bond that is meaningful in any way, and they probably won't talk to them much ever again. But I think Peter is one of those people that I will have a friendship and relationship with in the future, but at the same time, he's a person that I really want to beat. Not that he's really my rival, but he he's probably the teammates I've had that is the closest to my accomplishments, and he's he's very similar to me in, in our personality and the way that we work. So... Of course I want to beat him. And I know that he really wants to beat me too. And I think that uh, I would have liked to play him in the finals to split. Since at least to this point in time, you have played with this one team for so long with TSM, obviously since season four, right through to now, we're in season eight. In the past, whenever I used to think of TSM, Reginald was always the first name I thought of because, you know, individually he was one of the star players. Obviously, he owns the fucking team that helps. And he was just such a vocal figure, you know? It's hard not to think of him. But I have to say, yeah. if I think of TSM now, Bjorks is the first thing I think of because he's the one, like, thread that goes all the way through back to the past seasons and has been in all the different lineups. Obviously, you've won most of the championships. When you retire... Do you, what do you think about this fact that, you know, other people have been to different teams. I mean, Double is on like going for his third different team championship. You know, you know, other people have careers where it's natural to go from, you know, oh, I had a better offer here or oh, it's time to move on. What what do you think of this legacy you've created where you've been with this one team for so long? I mean, I don't know if esports is at this level yet, but in sports, like if you retired tomorrow and you were on like the Lakers or something in basketball, they'd make like a statue for you outside the fucking stadium, you know, of like <laughs> you were the mouse or something. So what do you think of this legacy you've built? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of that. I've been able to stay in a team for so long. And I think it's just other players will move around based on what roster there is. But the reason I stayed in TSM is because of Andy. And like I said, our common values and that we both care about the same thing. So even though maybe at one time I felt like, Oh, this team has a lot of good players, but then I'll talk to Andy and he'll do everything within his power to get the best roster that he can. And, he will take the consequences for it. So I think even even now I'm not the best played, best paid mid laner in the LCS, but 
I, I didn't want to sell out and join one of these teams that might have a mediocre roster. I'm I'm really still here to win, and that's also why it's such a big disappointment that we didn't make it further because that is really my my one true goal. Uh, I know some players they 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 just play pro because they don't have anything else to do, or it's good money, or they live a luxurious lifestyle, or they want to build a brand so they can be an influencer in the future. But really, none of that is important to me or on my mind. At the end of this interview, do you have a final message for people watching, or do you have someone you want to thank or say hello to? In this in this recent year or two, especially when I started receiving more hate, I, I've become a lot more grateful towards the fans that seem like they truly care about me and they really care about the team. And, and they're not bandwagoners or just these people that like me for my play. They actually care about me as a person. And I've come to appreciate them and try to to make them feel appreciated as fans too so uh, i just want to say i'm i appreciate all all the fans that stick with me and support me even when i do poorly or my team does poorly and especially to the fans that are able to come out to lcs every week they're always wearing their tsm shirts they they miss you know time with their family and friends to support us every week and that just makes it feel really special for me to be a pro because it's easy to lose track of of the fans and the influence you can have on people when you're just grinding super hard every single day. It just becomes all about you, your improvement, your team's improvement, how everything is going and your results. But when I meet those people, it really puts everything in perspective. And I'm grateful that I can have that uh, positive effect on people's lives. Tusen tak. Tusen tak. <laughs> This video was supported by Dean Tanglas, Twitch Twitch Twitch, Sanity, G-Man, Kokupsi, Andreas Westerland, Alex Adams, Mikkel Hansen, Jerky's Minion, Anthony, Bash, Daniel Yordanov, Jordan Senkov, Vexi, Kevin Haupt, Jason A, and Travis G. Greb. Want to suggest a guest to appear on my show or a topic to discuss? Perhaps you'd like to ask me a question. In 2018, for the first time in history, you can directly influence and support my content with the Patreon link below. Unlock the code to the streets and join the Skrilluminati today.